Finally, my first day at school has come. Yay! This special occasion called for my favorite hoodie. Super cool, right? <laughs> but then, out of nowhere, I was blocked by a group of boys and their cheesy pickup lines. No time for monkey mm -hmm. business, but they wouldn't let me go. Hey, do you know who I am? I'm... Everything suddenly went blurry. Oh no, my glasses! I stumbled around trying to grab them back, but got shoved to the floor. Everyone scram. Give me that. I looked up and vaguely saw my hero offering me a hand. He gave me my glasses and I profusely thanked him. But he just gave me a cold look and walked off without saying a word. Strange. Oh, by the way, I'm Hazel Palmer, 17 years old. But I'm not here as a student, but a teacher. Yes, you heard it right. Not to brag, but I'm kind of a genius. <laughs> I even got offered a position in my college's research project, which I have rejected to pursue my dream of becoming a high school teacher. So here I am on my very first day of fulfilling it. First, I was introduced to the other teachers, but unlike what I had in mind, they just threw me judgy looks. Luckily, after the meeting, a young teacher named Rebecca kindly welcomed me and even tipped me off about some of the rebels at school. Now time to meet my students. As soon as I finished my introduction, the whole class immediately turned into a beehive. Miss, how about we continue this lesson at the movies tonight? Mullet, Paris nose. This guy must be the notorious Lucas that Rebecca warned me about. Please, as if you'd date someone who would wear such a goofy hoodie. Yeah, who let a weeaboo teach here? Jeez, I didn't expect this reaction. I tried to restore the silence, but to no avail. Ugh, I'm out of patience. Quiet, or else you'll all get Fs. Thank God it worked. Whew, that'll show them who's in charge. But here comes another problem. No way! There's gotta be someone who's really here to study, right? Okay, who is our class's top student? Ethan! Ah, didn't he help me in the hallway? But it looked like he didn't recognize me. Okay, let's see. Ethan, right? Could you solve this equation? A equation? N no, equation. I suppose spelling is a bit hard for a numbers person like you. And the whole class burst into laughter. Jeez, this guy was unbelievable. Hmm, how about the second best student? Cassie Santago? That name sounded just like my old classmates. I turned to the corner where an arm reluctantly raised. Oh my, it's her! So good to see a familiar face here. But why is she avoiding me? That afternoon, while walking to my car, I saw Cassie and her friends picking on a girl. Upon seeing me, they immediately ran away, but I managed to catch Cassie. Cassie, since when did you become a mean girl? None of your business. Report me to the principal if you like. Then she strutted away, leaving me standing there confused. Since when had the sweet Cassie ended up on the dark side? Turned out, not long ago, Cassie's father passed away in an accident, leaving her to live with her stepmother. This must left her in so much grief that she put up this cold, reckless facade as a defense mechanism. That's so sad. So, to make Cassie feel included, and also to improve this whole class's performance, I came up with a master plan. More homework, not finished, minus points. And every lesson will come with a gift, a test during recess, and I asked Cassie and Ethan to help the other students. But when I called Cassie to the board, strangely, she couldn't do a simple equation. At first, I thought that it was just her being rebellious, but during the test that day, I noticed her copying Ethan's answers. Does that mean all her A's were from cheating? Not only that, the even shocker thing I found out was that Ethan was her stepbrother. After class, I came to talk to her, but she didn't pay me any attention. Cassie, I know the secret behind your A's. High scores mean nothing when they're not from your own hard work. But out of my business. <laughs> You're as much my friend as you are a proper teacher. I'd be pleased to tutor you. How about today? See you in the library after school. As if I care. Her words did hurt, but I guess she was just trying to keep her cold image. So I still waited for her, but she never showed up. No matter how much I tried, Cassie ignored me and kept cheating. During the midterm test, she even blatantly snatched Ethan's paper. It's true she's my friend, but I couldn't let it slide any longer, so I dismissed her test. That had to be done. <sighs> On the same day, while I was in the library searching for materials, I heard familiar voices talking. Ms. Palmer is way too much. She even dismissed Cassie's test today. Can you believe this? Why can't she be understanding like you? Cut her some slack, Sadie. She's just doing what she thinks is best. So that's what my students really thought of me? After everything I did to try and help them, 
Yet all I got back was bad-mouthing? And Rebecca was so nice to defend me like that. No wonder they liked her. <sighs> a few days later, the unexpected happened. Cassie, Lucas, and a few others came and asked for extra lessons. Finally, they started to have another eye on studying. But little did I know that it's just a ruse for my dear students to turn the following days into a nightmare. And the instigator was Lucas, I supposed. One day, I almost fainted upon finding a huge ant nest inside my bag. The other day, my pants were stuck to the chair with some gum. <sighs> Fortunately, Ethan always showed up in time to help me. He's such a riddle. Unlike before, not only did he try to defend me in class, but he also helped me carry my textbooks. But I didn't expect him to care that much. One time, I saw him at the car wash where I worked part-time. I quickly hid behind a car, but Ethan just kept walking towards my wash box. I'm here to see you, so no need to hide. Let me give you a hand. After my shift, Ethan took me home. We talked a lot, and I felt comfortable enough to tell him about my mom's health condition and how I took this part-time job to cover her hospital fee. This side of him was far different from the normal, and it was heartwarming. Suddenly, we noticed an elderly lady who seemed lost, so we offered to take her home. And guess what? She's the grandma of the notorious Lucas. I was truly surprised by how much of a rebel like Lucas cared for his Nana. I could tell he really loved her a lot. Poor boy. She's the only family he got now. Lucas, I know studying is not your thing, but have you thought about how happy your grandma would be if you at least tried? Since then, Lucas stopped causing me any mischief, and so did the other students. Now they could even do simple math themselves. Baby steps. <laughs> Seeing my effort finally bore fruit, I set up a parent meeting to report students' progress. Halfway through my presentation, a photo of me cosplaying as Sailor Moon popped up on the screen. Oh my god, why is it here? How dare you let this childish thing teach my kids? Then she stormed off, followed by everyone else. I thought I finally had my students on my side. Turns out I never did. Then came the last straw, my mom's medical test results. I couldn't help but cry, letting all my bottled up emotions out. Then, suddenly, a hand laid on my shoulder. What's wrong? My mom's health turned worse, and she needs an urgent operation. I'm sorry to hear that. It's all gonna be okay. Be strong, Miss Palmer. I appreciated him comforting me, and when I felt a bit better, we decided to leave. But the door was locked from the outside. It must have been a prank from my students, again. We tried banging the door and screaming for help, but eventually gave up and waited for someone to come. This quiet atmosphere sure does have a way of making people open up, and I got to know about Ethan. Seemed like both of us have problems with our beloved family. What's yours? I... I have a sister. You know who. That I really adore. But no matter how hard I try, she always builds a wall between us. Oh, wasn't this the first time Ethan talked about his personal life? He always put on a cold and distant mask. But I knew deep down he had his struggles too. I was so absorbed in his story that I forgot about being locked up and gradually fell asleep until a buzzing sound startled me and countless phone cameras were pointing at us. Guys, check your phones. Look what Miss Palmer and Ethan have been doing this whole time. Oh my, a bunch of photos of me and Ethan have been uploaded on the school website. And from some angles, it looked like we were kissing. <gasps> oh no, I tried to explain, but they just threw me a disgusted look. And why was Ethan just standing here saying nothing? This soon reached the principal. He told me there would be a case hearing for inappropriate relationship with a student. How was this even possible? As I dragged my feet to the principal's office, suddenly I heard familiar voices shouting. Why did you do that? I told you to find her weakness and look what you got. Nothing. I've done everything I could. What else do you want? Everything? Then why is she still here? As long as she's around, she messes up our cheating stuff. And mom will get my head chewed off for being useless at school. Or is that what you want, brother? What? <gasps> so Cassie had been pulling the strings this entire time? And Ethan was her puppet, befriending me just to please his sister. I knew she hated me, but did Ethan have to be so heartless too? Cassie then caught my eye, so I ran away. I was still trying to process this when I walked in to see the school council glaring at me. You're an insult to the teaching profession which leaves us no choice. I was ready for the worst when Ethan rushed in. Stop, it was me who deliberately jammed the classroom's lock to get back at her for being too strict, but I accidentally got stuck too. There's nothing going on between us. And so I was cleared of all charges and Ethan ended up in a week long suspension. 
Why did he do that after all? After such a long trial, I drove around town to blow off some steam, then saw Cassie fighting with a security guard. I found out that Cassie stole a bracelet and was refusing to call her parents. The guard said he'd have to call the cops, so I came forward as her teacher to bail her out. Cassie asked me why I helped her, but I didn't bother explaining myself and just left. Since that day, Cassie didn't attend the extra classes. After his suspension, Ethan returned with his offhand attitude. <sighs> no time to worry about those two. My mission now was to prepare my students for the upcoming finals and regain my prestige. Luckily, they started to take studying seriously and invested a lot in these tests. One day, when I walked into class, some students even asked me to help solve advanced exercises. Two weeks later, when the results came, my excited students all rushed over to me. Miss Palmer, thanks to you, the questions were the same as the ones you showed us the other day, so it only took us a blink to finish. What are they talking about? Before I could understand, the principal summoned me to his office. As I entered, he angrily showed me the math sheet that I was allegedly teaching in the extra class. What kind of work ethic allows leaking exam questions, Miss Palmer? Leak the test? <gasps> me? No! Please! No more excuses. You're fired. No, no! They can't punish me for something I didn't do. Someone must have framed me. I asked my students where they got that piece of paper and they said it was already on the table when they came to class. So Cassie and Ethan must have been behind this. Good job, Ethan, for putting up their remorse act just to set up a bigger plan to humiliate me. Okay then, they won. Unemployed and desperate, with hospital bills to cover, I had to work full time at the car wash, as well as taking night shifts at 7-Eleven. But besides the measly wages was a bonus of rotten eggs and tomatoes, scornful looks and snarky comments saying I didn't deserve the teacher title. <sighs> the scandal truly turned my life upside down. Then, when I was at the hospital with my mom, suddenly Ethan rushed in and said he would clear my name. Clear my name? Wasn't he the one who put dirt on me? What was he playing this time? With nothing to lose, I reluctantly went with him. He led me to the school's control room. The principal was also there. Then I saw Sadie standing on stage. Ethan said it was her who discreetly put the math sheet on the table. What? But Rebecca? I distributed the test like you said, but I'm scared. What if someone finds out? Don't worry, now that Miss Palmer's fired, who else can dig this up? I'm only taking back my position as the beloved teacher who can take cover for y'all. No, I have to tell the principal everything. Who would believe you? I would. Furious, I rushed over to the stage and confronted her. Rebecca, I thought you were my friend. How could you? Don't ask me, ask your phony self. Weren't you just trying to get the students to like you? What nonsense was she saying? I'm just doing my part of being a good teacher. How could she be so selfish and cruel? Out of jealousy? Miss Palmer earned her students' respect with her pure heart. Look at you. The so-called love you have comes from buttering them up with all your lies. That's why they turn stubborn and make light of studying. I never knew you were that kind of person. How could you call yourself a teacher? The principal couldn't hide his rage, fired Rebecca, then apologized to me and offered me my job back. But after all these troubles, this school had completely drained me. I couldn't take it anymore, so I refused. As I was wiping away my tears, Ethan came to my side. Miss Palmer, I'm sorry for everything I did. I just tried to please Cassie, but now I know I was only hurting you. I've already known about that. I was about to leave when a group of students led by Cassie approached us. Then Ethan told me it was Cassie who helped him with the plan to bait Rebecca into admitting her actions. Sorry for all the horrible things I did to you. Please stay. We've learned a lot since you moved here. Please don't leave us. Such a crazy term. I ended up staying. I mean, this is my dream job after all, and I'm not one to give up that easily. I also talked to Cassie's stepmom about her studying. Turns out she didn't realize her strict approach was causing a rift between them all. Cassie, Ethan, and their mom had a talk, and now they seem to understand each other better. I was so happy for them, and we became friends after that. Time flies, and now my students, or my friends, to be correct, graduated, and would soon fly off to pursue their own dreams. Suddenly, Ethan dragged me to a corner. So from now on, we're no longer teacher and student, right? I guess, but so... But could you still teach me? Teach me how to love you.
I was grabbing a book out of my locker when some guy's shout startled me. Hey everyone, the results are over here! Oh, <laughs> it's just the results of the Mind Buzz, our annual high school general knowledge competition. People, what's the rush? Don't we all know what it'll be like already? See, nothing's changed. That's my name, there, the first place of Willowmere High, as always. And of course, what came along with it were endless praises from everyone. Way to go, Millie, you're our school superhero. Oh my gosh, you're amazing, I'm so jealous of you. Yep. Hi, I'm Millie, the girl who always aces every school contest and is therefore adored by the other students, all the teachers, and the principal. Later that day, as soon as I stepped out of art class, Alice, my excitable best friend, jumped out of nowhere and squealed out, I just found this really cool place. We have to go there right now. No chance. I have the final round of the blast from the past contest tomorrow. I mean, history is my forte, so I'm sure to win, but I still want to cram in some last minute studying. Come on. We all know you'll win anyway. You even said that yourself. So let's just hang out for a little, please. Fine, but only because I'm an amazing friend. Hmm, okay, I have to admit, this place was actually kind of cool. It's an adorable cafe hidden at the end of a street corner. But wait a minute, what's up with that sticker on the window? Isn't that the Leafmore High School symbol? No way we're setting foot in that taboo place! I tried tugging on Alice's arm and gesturing for us to leave, but she stood her ground and replied, Come on, Millie, we have to try their croissants. All the food bloggers are talking about it. But this is Leafmore's territory. Look! So? It's not like anyone will recognize us. Before I could comprehend what was happening, she dragged me inside. Oh well, it seems like we've gone too far to draw back, so I may as well sample what this place has to offer. Why was our order taking so long? And what was with Alice? Ugh, how many selfies did one girl need to take? I was clenching my fists to stop myself from anxiously fidgeting when two boys walked towards our table. Hey cutie, I've not seen you in here before. What grade are you in? Oh no, how should I answer this question? I quickly turned away, pretending to rummage through my bag to avoid his gaze, but they still didn't leave me alone, as the other guy said, Wait, this girl doesn't seem to be from our school, are you? Oh snap, did he recognize me? My skin turned clammy with nerves and I thought I was gonna throw up. Then suddenly a voice rang out. Sorry I'm late, have you been waiting long? Then he plonked himself down next to us. Seeing that, the two guys left. Phew! But who is this guy? Do we know him? Oh my god, Evan, it's you! Mmm, is that the new Calvin Klein cologne? It smells amazing on you. Huh? Evan? As in, Evan Summers? The top student in Leafmore, aka my biggest competition in tomorrow's contest? To Alice's excitement and my puzzled look, Evan just lightly smiled, then got up to leave. <sighs> He's indeed a cold angel. What? All he was to me was arrogant. You're probably wondering what the deal between Willowmere and Leafmore is, right? They're the two biggest high schools in this town, but like the same poles of magnets, they repel each other. The two schools have been rivals since forever, competing with each other from academic achievements to collective activities. In competitions organized by the town, such as marathons, Halloween decorations, or even cooking contests. And of course, the students from both schools despise each other so much that we have boundaries in town. For example, this cafe is only for Leafmore students, while only Willowmere students are allowed in that bookstore. Breaking these rules could lead to outright carnage. The schools take this super seriously. Hence, there's even a rule saying we can't interact with each other. And dating is a real no-no. You see, as the top student in Willowmere, I can't let anyone find out I've stepped foot in Leafmore territory, as if they do, my life won't be worth living. And also, because of my number one position, I have a responsibility to help my school win as many prizes as possible. And this history contest is no exception. I anxiously waited for the host to announce the results. And the last 20 points go to Leafmore High School, which makes them the winners of today's contest. From the other side of the hall, the Leafmore students erupted into applause, and they all charged at Evan and hugged him. Seeing the arrogant Evan with a triumphant face made me even more upset. Congratulations, you were amazing! Alice, we lost! Only by five points! 
Second place is still good, but it was me who was defeated by that Evan! Poor Alice is still trying to keep her shy smile at me. I didn't want to take it out on her either, so I quickly left. The next day I was walking along the school corridor, minding my own business, when I passed a group of students gossiping about me. Poof, she definitely lost the quiz on purpose. Yeah, her question was so easy. Everyone knows that the first US dollar was printed in 1862. Why were they saying such mean things about me? I tried my best to ignore their jibes and distract myself with my phone, but what is this? Someone had uploaded a picture of me, Alice, and Evan all sitting together in that cafe the other day. Oh no. And worse still, from this angle, we all looked kind of close. Furious, I went to leave, but Polly, this annoying girl, blocked my way and mocked me. Millie, if you don't like this place, you could have transferred schools. Losing to leave more on purpose is just embarrassing. I did no such thing. Not that it's any of your business. I hurried away from her and her smirking friends. The problem is, it seemed like the entire school had seen that picture and concluded that I'm a traitor. At least things couldn't get any worse, right? Wrong. My bad luck continued when I got my English Lit essay back. A B minus. This can't be right. I never get anything lower than an A. Ever! I was checking through my test when suddenly there was an announcement on the speaker, asking me to come to the principal's office. Millie, you're usually such an excellent student, but I've received some unpleasant news about you recently, and your grades are slipping significantly. I could only stare down at the floor and mumbled, I'm really sorry. I'd never been scolded by the principal before. This was the worst day of my life. Miss Garcia was silent for a moment before she continued. However, I still have faith in you, so I'm giving you one last chance to prove yourself. The town's hosting a Rube Goldberg machine camp and our school must win. Can you make that happen, Millie? I forced a smile and nodded. No problem, ma'am. The first prize will be ours. Trust me. This is my chance to show everyone that I'm devoted to this school. However, there's one teensy tiny problem. Physics is not my forte. It's all right, I just gotta do my best, right? I spent the next two weeks planning, researching, and testing out ideas with my group. We finally managed to create the perfect Rude Goldberg machine. It includes 15 genius steps to complete the final task. We're surely gonna secure all these bonus points. Finally, the camp weekend arrived, and I was super stoked to show off my team's entry. Tomorrow will be it. I'll get Willowmere's name back on top again. Then suddenly, Miss Garcia tapped my shoulder and gestured me over to an empty corner and worriedly said, Leafmore's machine is highly praised by the judges. At this rate, they're most likely to win, and that'll mean humiliation for us. Don't worry, I'm trying my best. We'll add some extra magnets and springs. It's no use. The only way we'll win over Leafmore is if their entry encounters problems. She sighed, then turned to leave. Feeling deflated, I stared down at my feet. That's when I saw a pocket knife, with Miss Garcia's name printed on it, lying on the ground. I picked it up and called out, Miss, you dropped your knife! But Miss Garcia didn't stop walking or turn back, and just did a snipping gesture with her fingers. Could it be that Miss Garcia meant... Yep, definitely. That's the only way. So that night, I waited until everyone else was asleep, then I snuck into the gallery and cut a piece of wire holding the light bulb of Leafmore's model. That should be enough. I was about to leave the room when suddenly the lights came on. What are you doing here? I... I... You just did this, didn't you? Um... Yeah? So what? Go ahead, tell on me if you want. This is all so meaningless. Then he sat down and started fixing his model. Huh? What's meaningless? Good God, he's so full of himself. Fine then. Just you wait, Evan. I'll beat you with my own talent. Let's see if you'll still be Mr. Arrogant then. It was my team's turn, and for the first three steps, the Rube Goldberg machine worked quite smoothly. But when it came to the fourth step, suddenly the wooden slide collapsed causing the marble to fall to the ground and the machine to stop working. We all stared at each other in panic. No, 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 this couldn't be happening. We tested it many times this morning and it had worked perfectly fine. I rushed over to check what was wrong with the machine, 
but I struggled and couldn't find a way to fix it, when suddenly a voice said, Let me see. I looked up. It was Evan. I stepped aside to make room for him, when suddenly Ms. Garcia appeared. I see what's happened here. Clearly, Leafmore High knew the only way they'd win was by sabotaging the best entry. The whole hall started to stir, but I felt my skin prickle with unease. I didn't think this was Leafmore's doing. Look at Evan. He didn't even bother telling the judges about last night's incident. Immediately after that, Leafmore's principal, Miss Harris, said, Miss Garcia, you can't go around accusing us without proof. Clearly, you're the one who feels the need for underhand tactics to win, not us. Then she held out her phone and circled the crowd so everyone could see. I gasped in shock. There on the screen was a picture of me standing next to Leafmore's model with a knife. Miss Harris continued. Seeing as we'd managed to fix it in time, we decided not to mention anything else about it. But then you dared to accuse us. The crowd glared and tutted at me, and I longed for the floor to swallow me whole. I put blood, sweat, and tears into creating our model, and now people just thought I was a cheat. The worst part was they were right. I was one. The jury went off to discuss this. Then they announced their conclusion. Willowmere had been disqualified. Immediately, Mrs. Garcia piped in. This is hardly fair. That was the action of one individual, not the whole group. I assure you that Millie is no longer on the team, so let my school continue to compete without her. I froze in shock. How could Miss Garcia do this to me? It had been all her idea, hadn't it? She'd given me the knife. The realization of what just happened hit me and I fell to my knees and burst into tears. All that hard work and for nothing. Even Alice hugging me in comfort didn't release me from my gut-wrenching, sinking feeling. Then to my surprise, Evan said, Mrs. Garcia, can you explain why I found this knife with your name engraved on it next to our model? He raised the knife up for everyone to see. Oops, in all the stress of last night, I must have dropped it. Ms. Garcia turned ghostly pale and everyone started to buzz about it. I can't believe you colluded with your students to do this. You're no different from her. Last night, Miss Harris instructed me to tamper with Willowmere's model, but I refused. As if we win, I wanted it to be fairly. The whole hall once again began to stir and copped on amazed as Evan continued. I'm so tired of the petty feud between our schools. It's so dumb and meaningless. The jury went off to discuss this further and came back with a new announcement. Both schools were disqualified. It's shameful. But, well, it's for the best. We really don't deserve to be here. Oh boy, that sure was eventful. The scandal between the two schools was hot gossip in the town for days. They even brought it up at the monthly town meeting. That's when the truth came out that Ms. Garcia and Ms. Harris had history. They were in the same year at school and were fiercely competitive against each other. So years later, when both of them became principals of the two schools, it began this whole feud war. In the end, both principals were forced to leave their positions. So now what? Well, there aren't any dumb rules about where I can go anymore, which is good, because I actually really like it here. I've learned my lesson, and I'm never going to let anyone pressure me into cheating ever again. Peace has returned to school life, and it feels good. Oh, and as for Evan, I'm actually studying with him right now for our next Blast from the Past quiz. Only this time, I'm definitely going to beat him. Admit it. Come on. You took my necklace, didn't you? Mindy looked at us and shook her head. She was sweating. Well, there are only three of us in this house, and if Andy didn't take it, then obviously it was you. Seriously, Cass, you got to believe me I didn't take it. But clearly she was lying, because when I rummaged through her bag, Cass's necklace was right there. Cass told her to get out of her house, and Mindy burst into tears. Poor Mindy. I really wanted to stop Cass, but she seriously hates people touching her stuff, so I just kept quiet. You see, Cass and I are pretty much joint at the hip. We've always lived in the same neighborhood, so we grew up together and shared everything. Well, almost everything. 
except one little secret that would probably ruin our friendship forever if she found out about it. Andy, what are you doing? I started to stammer. Uh, um, uh, um, this is so cute. Honestly, I'm so upset about Mindy. I can't believe she'd do something like that. I smiled, not knowing what to say. I mean, it was me who'd exposed her. Suddenly, I felt so guilty. Right at that moment, we got to the checkout. Cass took everything out of the cart to give to the cashier. Hang on, she exclaimed. What is this? This item has the barcode ripped off. The cashier made a fuss for a while and even called the manager. Cass and I stood there for ages, trying to figure out what was going on. Cass even started crying, thinking she'd be accused of shoplifting. After about 30 minutes, the store manager came and told us we could leave. They kept the items that had no barcodes and sent us on our way. Phew, that was close. What? What do you mean? Oh, nothing. I'm just relieved that we didn't get into any trouble. Just so you know, though, that wasn't the first time we'd got ourselves into an awkward situation while out shopping. Sometimes it was the torn barcodes. Sometimes the tags were missing. Then the security alarm would always go off at the door. And all of these situations weren't just coincidences. Okay, I gotta be honest here. The thing is, I have a habit of pilfering. Not because I can't afford stuff. I mean, my dad's the owner of a bank, so money isn't the issue. My dad basically buys me the latest phone every month. And you should see my wardrobe. I have all the designer bags. I steal because it gives me the kind of thrill that my boring daily life just can't give me. My dad just hands me money every day. And never stops to think that maybe I'd like a hug or a how are you. Ever since my mom left when I was just a baby. He's been using money as a way to keep the peace. So one day when I was in elementary school, I stole a hairpin from the girl who sat next to me. It felt so good. Like my own little secret. I loved the drama that came with it. And the fact that no one ever suspected me because I was such a rich little girl. After the hairpin, I got addicted to stealing little things and couldn't stop. It felt like the only thing I could control in my life. And so I kept on doing it. And here I am now. Still getting a buzz from it every single time. And yep, you've guessed it. The one who took the necklace at Cass's sleepover was none other than me, of course. But at that time, because I was so scared, I slipped the necklace into Mindy's bag and pretended to find it there. I was deep in thought when suddenly Alex's scream startled me. Guys, I've lost my unicorn pen. You know the pen that glows? The whole class was suddenly in uproar. Some friends were trying to look for it. Meanwhile, Alex was walking straight towards me. Andrea must have taken it. This morning when I took out the pen, me and her were the only ones in here. I looked up at Alex, my heart pounding in my chest. This is it. I'm so done this time. Then I suddenly looked over at Scott Parker, the cute boy who just transferred to our class. Oh no, I couldn't give him a bad impression of me. I had to quickly think of a way out of this. You waited until I went to the bathroom to take it, didn't you? Alex, I'd never do such a thing. Besides, I have loads of nice pens. In fact, you can have one if you'd like. I pulled out a beautiful pink rhinestone pen from my pencil case and handed it to Alex. While Alex stared in awe at my pen, I suggested everyone go check their lockers to see if her pen was there. Sure enough, right by the lockers was the glowing unicorn pen she'd lost. Right in front of Scott. I picked up the pen and handed it to Alex. I'm so upset you thought I'd steal this from you. But it's okay. At least we found it. Alex blushed and apologized to me. Our other friends also blamed Alex for not looking for it carefully enough and for jumping to conclusions about me. Next time, don't be so silly. Andrea is a good person. Besides, her family is so wealthy. Why would she need to steal a pen from you? I just smiled and walked away. Suddenly, a voice called out from behind me. It was Scott. He looked at me and said, Wow, that was totally dramatic. I'm Scott, by the way. You're Andrea, right? I'm sorry if this is a bit forward, but here's my number. Excuse me? Am I dreaming? Of course I texted him as soon as I got home. He said he was so impressed with how I'd handled being blamed for the whole thing. Soon we were chatting every day, and eventually he asked me to be his girlfriend. I was so happy. But there was just one small problem. Ever since we'd started dating, I felt really ashamed about my bad habit of stealing things. I was determined to give it up, but it wasn't going to be easy. 
One day, Scott came to pick me up and asked if I wanted to go to the bookstore. A bookstore? No, I don't want to go there. Can we go somewhere else? Please? Seeing me panic like that, Scott looked puzzled. Then he suggested we go to his place to watch a movie, which I was fine with. Hopefully there would be no temptations for stealing there. A middle-aged woman opened the door for us at Scott's place. Oh, this is Sandra, our maid. Hi, Sandra. I'm Andrea. But instead of saying hi back, Sandra just stared at me in a seriously creepy way. It actually sent shivers down my spine. After watching the movie, Scott and his mom invited me to stay for dinner. Scott's mother, Mrs. Doris Parker, was really sweet, and we had some interesting chats. While waiting for dessert, I got up to go to the bathroom. But as I stepped out there, I almost bumped into Sandra. She was just standing there staring at me again. Uh, sorry. She didn't say anything, but just kept staring at me in this weird way. Oh my gosh, why was she looking at me like that? The next morning at school, Scott told me his mother had just lost a valuable ring. She had a jewelry tray next to the bathroom sink, and after washing her hands, she'd forgotten to put her ring on. After dinner, the ring was no longer there. I comforted Scott, then made an excuse to go to the ladies' room. I needed to seriously think about this. Honestly, I'd tried my best to not get the urge to steal at Scott's place. But when I'd seen Doris's beautiful ring... No, I had to find a way to return it. No one could find out about this. And I had sworn to myself that I would never let this happen again. Hello, Sam. Huh? Where's Sandra? Oh, she was fired. Mrs. Parker said Sandra had stolen her jewelry. Anyway, may I help you? Oh, no. I had to return this ring immediately. Poor Sandra. Scott came down for me and said he'd make dinner. I glanced through the window to find Doris was having tea in the garden. This was my chance. I snuck up to her room, quietly tiptoed in, and headed towards her jewelry box. Suddenly, the light came on. Tell me what on earth are you doing here? I quickly turned around, dropping the ring to the floor. M Mindy? Why are you here? I'm Scott's cousin. So it was you who stole the ring. I can't believe my cousin is dating you. Hearing the noise, Scott and his mom ran upstairs while I was still dumbfounded and speechless. It was you who stole Cass's necklace too, wasn't it? She won't even speak to me because of you. I'm so sorry. I know it's not okay, but I couldn't stop myself. I've been feeling so guilty, so that's why I'm returning it. I was still kneeling on the ground when a hand reached out to me and helped me stand up. I'll handle this. Come on, let's have a chat outside, shall we? Turns out Mrs. Parker is a therapist. She could see I had a problem and offered to help me. I told her how guilty I'd been feeling about Sandra getting fired and asked Doris if she could call her for me so I could apologize. Thirty minutes later, Sandra arrived. As soon as Doris saw her, she apologized and offered her the job back. But no, no, ma'am, I was the one who stole it, and I deserve to be punished. I'm sorry, Sandra, I've already confessed to Mrs. Parker that I stole the ring. I didn't mean to get you fired. I just couldn't help it. You didn't do anything wrong. I, it was me? I was greedy? She is innocent. What on earth is going on? Obviously I was the thief, so why was she defending me? Why are you doing this? Do we know each other, Sandra? And that's when the truth came pouring out. Sandra was my mom. Yeah, I don't know how this is possible either. So according to her words, she'd had a huge fight with my dad when I was a baby, and she'd fled to another city where she found a job working for Scott's family. When they moved to Seattle, she came with them. Even though she was nervous about returning back to where me and my dad were, she'd carried so much guilt about leaving us, and never in a million years did she expect to bump into me at Scott's house. I was so shocked, I couldn't even speak. I'd imagined this moment my whole life, and now... Here I was, standing face to face with her, and she'd even taken the blame for me. I couldn't believe it. Mom, I'm so sorry that I stole the ring. I, I can't believe you're really here. Sweetie, you don't need to apologize. I'm the one who will be apologizing for the rest of my life, abandoning my daughter like that. What kind of mom am I? How will you ever forgive me? We stood there hugging for what felt like forever, and I knew in that moment that I'd never steal again. Doris diagnosed me as having kleptomania due to a lack of love for my mom, but now that my mom was back, I had no reason to seek out those thrills from stealing. I had everything I needed right here. 
There were a few moments where I almost stole again, but Doris told me to call my mom as soon as I felt the urge, and when my mom picked up the phone and I heard her voice, the urge faded, and I felt so much better. Scott and Cass and Mindy forgave me after Doris sat them all down and explained more about my addiction and where it stemmed from. Now, Scott and I are still together, and I see my mom every day at Scott's place. My dad hasn't forgiven my mom for leaving yet, but baby steps. Finally, I feel like everything is complete, and my pilfering is a thing of the past. Hi there, I'm Flora, Portside High School cheerleading captain and beauty pageant queen. My natural beauty and charisma mean that everyone's drawn to me, but hey, I don't make it easy for them. I only allow a select few to get close to me as I can't be seen associating with just anyone. Only my classmate Nina is pretty enough to have the coveted position of my BFF. Birds of a feather flock together, right? My high school life was perfect. But then, in the space of one day, that all changed. The principal, Mrs. Harrington, told me that due to my cheerleading abilities, I'd won a scholarship to the ACL Academy, a boarding school for the athletically gifted. And I was leaving today! Huh? This made no sense! I mean, I don't even do sports! I rushed straight home to discuss it with my mom and found her sitting on the couch surrounded by a load of shopping bags. Yep. She'd already spent the scholarship money before I'd even found out the news. I know mom loves money, but how could she make such a huge decision about my life without discussing it with me first? Ugh. Looks like I had no choice but to leave Portside High behind and go to this stupid sports school. Whatever. I'm a skilled cheerleader after all. It'd be a breeze, right? Wrong. This new school sucked. On my very first day here, I was woken up at 6am and forced to run five laps around the stadium. God. Are these people superheroes or what? How are they able to run and laugh at the same time while well, I am panting like crazy? I didn't have time to catch my breath when the teacher made us move to the gym to lift weights. After three hours in the hellish gym, I barely had time to digest my lunch before they steered me into the volleyball court. Yep, that's the sport mom had registered me for. Ugh, this stupid sport. Finally, nighttime arrived, and I managed to crawl my aching body back to my dorm. God save me from this living nightmare! Suddenly, the door opened, and in stepped my three roomies, aka my volleyball teammates. Honestly, I don't even know if I could call them girls or not. One has super short cropped bangs, one doesn't say much and shuffles more than walks, and one wears clothes so baggy they resemble a tent. Obviously, I'm way out of their league. And you know what they all have in common? They're always sweaty. So gross. Come to think of it, I have to go take a shower ASAP. Otherwise, I might turn into one of them. Fresh out of the shower, I called Nina and blurted out how exhausted I was and how much I missed our school. Who are you? You must be so tired. Oh, by the way, I have some amazing news to tell you. There's a city beauty pageant coming up, and I'm representing the school! What? But I won the school beauty contest! Yeah, you did. But you don't attend Portside High anymore, so seeing as I came second, they've given me the spot. Too bad, as you definitely would have won. What? How unfair! I was still in shock when the dorm supervisor stormed in and took away my phone. Uh, yeah, I forgot to mention. This school even has a strict 10 p.m. phones away and lights off rule. It's all because they believe health is the most precious thing for an athlete. I tossed and turned all night. This beauty pageant was massive, and there's no way I could miss it. But I'm not at Portside High anymore. Instead, I'm stuck in this dumb jock academy. Hmm, if only I could get out of here. Huh, that's right. I have a brilliant idea. I need to get expelled. So, I decided to skip practice and go cause some havoc for three days straight. I poured paint into the pool, cut off the badminton strings, deflated all of the soccer balls, and of course, I made sure that the security cameras caught it all. And as expected, the principal eventually called me into his office. Yes, this was the moment I was waiting for. Soon I could pack and get out of here. Only the rest didn't exactly go to plan. If it had not been for Mrs. Harrington. Two laps of frog jumps around the soccer field. Now! 
What? Frog jumps? I hate those things! Why couldn't he just kick me out already? But wait, what does Mrs. Harrington have to do with this? After my punishment, I needed to vent. So, hugging my aching thighs, I called Nina to complain about my failed plan. And she just burst out laughing. <laughs> oh, Flora, those outdated tricks were never gonna work. You have to do something bold, like... <gasps> oh my god, Nina is a genius! The next night, following Nina's instructions, I sneaked out when everyone was asleep. That's right, I'm going to wake the whole school up with these firecrackers. I lit one in the dorm's backyard, then ran to hide behind the bushes. Three, two, one, and silence. Huh? I went back to check and saw that it had gone out. What's wrong? Is this one broken? I tried again and again, but the same thing happened each time. As if a ghost did it? Just the thought of it sent chills down my spine, so I sprinted right back to my room. Okay, so not only had my plan been a massive fail, but it had left me super tired. Needless to say, this morning's run was not fun. Zombie alert! Hmm, how come they look even more exhausted than me? Hey, have you guys heard about the doomed jock? He's the ghost in the dorm's backyard. Allegedly, he attended this academy years ago, and he exercised himself to death right there in the dorm's backyard. So now, he haunts it. What was she talking about? Could it be the one who messed with me yesterday? Was the doomed jock? I couldn't just give up like that. I needed to figure out a way to get out of this awful place before this ghost got me. Hmm... How about starting a fight? I heard that the fencing team and basketball team were the two toughest groups in the school. So, I sprayed paint on their fencing masks and punctured all of the basketballs, and left a fencing sword at the scene. Then I wrote both teams an anonymous letter. Sunday, 2 p.m., abandoned building near the back gate. When Sunday came, I hid in the abandoned house and waited for the two groups to arrive. Look at their tense faces, this was gonna be fun! I quickly called the cops, and then took advantage of the chaos to blend in with the feuding teams. I almost got punched in the face when, fortunately, the cops got there just in time, causing everyone to frantically flee the scene. I happily ran to a cop. It's me! I started this fight! But, to my surprise, the cop just asked if I was hurt. Then he hurriedly chased after the gang. Only then I realized that if I wanted to be caught, I had to do exactly what they did run away. Oh, man. I was staggering my way back to the dormitory, feeling deflated, when I spotted the fencing and basketball teams coming my way. Freaked out, I looked around for a place to hide, but there was only one car parked on the side of the road. With no other way, I ventured to open the car door and, oh, it wasn't locked. I quickly jumped in, hid under the back seat, and lay completely still. At that moment, the car door swung open, I closed my eyes and braced myself to catch some hands when suddenly the car revved up and left. Looking up, I saw the principal sitting in the driver's seat, whistling happily. Oh, so it was his car. After a while, the car stopped in front of a bar in town. Didn't expect a serious man like him to go to such places. But wait, an underage student being caught by the principal here would surely get me expelled, right? With that in mind, I hurriedly followed him, but at the door, a security guard stopped me and asked for my ID card. I had no idea what to do when suddenly a strange guy appeared. Hey cutie, need an ID card? How about this? I'll lend you a fake ID to get in. In exchange, you must go out with me tonight. Sounds good, huh? Well, I didn't plan on sticking around for long, as I would just get in, find the principal, and get caught right away anyway so I nodded in agreement. I was about to take the ID card from him when someone yanked me back and pushed me into a cab. My roommates! What are you doing here? Do you know you've just ruined my plan and- Ruined? Who's the one causing trouble here? Do you honestly believe that if you get expelled like that, your old school will take you back? <sighs> Fat chance. Huh? How'd you know that I'm trying to get expelled? Turns out my roommates overheard the conversation between me and Nina. It was them who extinguished my firecrackers in the campus backyard, then made up the doomed jock ghost story to make me stay away from there. 
Then, when the basketball and fencing team searched for me, it was them who lied that I was with them all day so I could get away with it. But what did you do that for? Don't get us wrong, we didn't do it for you. We did it to protect the school's reputation. Then they started telling me that, for the last few years, due to bad achievements, our school was on the chopping block to make space for industrial areas. The only way to convince the city council to keep our school was by winning the state's upcoming sports competition. We've all played sports for all of our lives. Sport is everything to us. If our school closes, we don't know where we'd go. That's why when we saw you being lazy and messing about, we couldn't just sit back and watch. Oh, I had no idea about this. Suddenly, I felt so guilty. I mean, of course I don't want to ruin their futures. I then also opened up to them and told them all about the beauty pageant. They insisted there must be a way to join the pageant without returning to my old school. So they searched around on Google, and guess what? Turns out the pageant accepts free candidates too, which means no school registration needed. What else could I wish for? I immediately signed up for it, and as a thank you to my new friends, I started making an effort at playing volleyball. I'm a tall girl, so my training position is a right side hitter. And you know what? There is this satisfaction whenever I was able to block a ball. Not gonna lie, this is much more interesting than I thought. That weekend, I went to the city to pick out some dresses for the beauty contest. I found myself immersed in racks of gorgeous gowns when a familiar voice startled me. How about this one, Mom? Stunning, sweetie. You're the most beautiful girl in this world. I don't know what possessed them to pick Flora over you. But no need to worry this time, as I have sent her far away. Yeah, that's where she belongs. I'll show them who's the true beauty queen now. What? No way! My old school principal is Nina's mom? And transferring me to the sports academy was part of her plan? Just so her daughter could go to the pageant? I was fuming. So as soon as Mrs. Harrington went outside to take a call, I walked straight over to confront Nina. I can't believe you're like that. Nina looked shocked at first, but then smirked as she said, Like what? Like someone who's far prettier, more talented, and crown-worthy than you? Thanks, sporty girl. I shoved past her and stormed out of there. Wait for it, Nina. We'll soon see who the real winner is. The next few weeks were crazy busy with volleyball practice and the pageant preparations. I may have only been a reserve, but I still wanted to give it my all to motivate the team. The sports competition soon arrived, and after two days of competing, the fate of the school came down to the final match. Our volleyball game! Talk about intense. It sucked it was on the same day as the beauty pageant, as I would have loved to be able to cheer them on from the player bench. But then, disaster struck. The girl who plays right side hitter sprained her wrist and couldn't play. The whole team looked so worried, and that made my heart ache. There was only one thing for it. I'd replace her. If I was quick, I could still make it to the beauty pageant afterward. Come on, Flora. Stay focused. Just one point left, and we'd win. Suddenly, the ball came flying at me. This was it. I hit it with all my might and... Score! We won! I was busy celebrating our victory when everyone suddenly asked me about the beauty pageant. Oh my god! I almost forgot! The match went on longer than I thought it would. My friends dragged me into the taxi, but when we got there, the show was already coming to an end. And worst of all, guess who was standing there wearing the winner's crown and looking all smug? Yep, Nina. Did you come to congratulate me? Thanks, bestie. Oh, you guys must be Flora's new friends. Hmm, that figures. How cute. Stop the act, Nina. Yes, they are my friends. They're not fake, and they're a thousand times more interesting than you. <laughs> Say whatever you want, but I'm a beauty queen now, and you're no longer at the same level as me. My friends started clenching their fists, so I quickly pulled them away before anything happened. Right at that time, an announcement came across the speaker. Attention, pageants. We've just discovered signs of voter fraud. Please stay inside the hall and await further confirmation. About 30 minutes later, the truth finally came out. Turns out, Nina's mom had paid for the voting texts. Needless to say, Nina had her crown taken off her immediately, 
And Mrs. Harrington also lost her principal job. <laughs> what goes around comes around, right? As for me, I'm not bothered about beauty pageants anymore. Instead, I have a new hobby, volleyball. Turns out I'm pretty good at it. And who knows, I might even become a professional player. And you know what the best part of all this is? I now have true friends by my side who I know will be willing to help me anytime and anywhere. Is it usual for you to sit on strangers the first time you meet them? This jerk. I'll show him that he's messing with the wrong girl. It's fine. Please don't hit him. Don't worry. And this is for mugging a kid. No, no, you've got it wrong. He just saved me from those muggers. And he was just teaching me how to fight back at them. Oh, my. I thought... It was just because the boy's bag was on the ground and that guy was holding his arm like he was about to hit him. I awkwardly stood up, literally screamed out to apologize, then ran straight home. So, as you can see, my home's a little different from the usual. My parents run a nursing home, so I grew up surrounded by the elderly. You were so embarrassed that you left him laying there and ran away? The first time I met my husband... I also knocked him over with my dolio chagi. Perhaps this boy is your destiny. Poof! No way, Mrs. Jones. Suddenly, my dad huffed past us. Oh no, I know that look. Something was bad. Lately, our finances haven't been so good. I went after him to check he was okay and found him talking to a man in the yard. On seeing me, the strange man waved me over. Do you know this person? Huh? That was the guy I almost punched earlier. That's right. The person you almost knocked out is my son. I saw everything, so I followed you here. He's got in with a bad crowd and lost focus on his studies. I want you to steer him in the right direction. I... I don't want to be a babysitter. I'm sorry. It's too bad about this nursing retreat, isn't it? Seems like it'll have to close soon. Although, if swayed, I don't mind being a major sponsor. <gasps> this was insane! So, all I needed to do was keep an eye on his son, and all the nursing home's problems would be solved? Dad said I didn't have to do it if I didn't want to, but how could I say no? Okay, I'll do it! So, which school am I transferring to? Jeez, everything here was so shiny. But if I had a choice... This would be the last school in town I ever wanted to attend. I entered the classroom and walked over to the only empty seat that happened to be at the back. I was about to sit down, then... Ah! Some dude pulled the chair aside and caused me to fall onto my butt. A hand appeared to pull me up, but as I went to grab it, it immediately drew back, leaving me sitting there embarrassed while everyone's laughing at me. Oops, sorry. I guess I should only give a hand when asked, right? Ugh, it was Blake. I quickly regained my cool face, sat down, and put on my headphones, pretending like I didn't hear any of those comments from other students about my rustic look. This girl seems interesting. The usual. A grand if you can win her heart in a month. Deal? Blake glanced at me and sneered at the guy. Easy. Deal. So that's how it's gonna be, is it? Luckily, I hadn't turned my music on yet, hence why I heard the whole conversation. Let me help you get some extra pocket money then, Blake. And it didn't take him long to start implementing his plan. At lunchtime, he enthusiastically led me to the canteen, guided me to get food, and even asked the lunch lady to get me an extra portion of yogurt. Nice try. I was trying to enjoy my lunch when a shrill voice sounded out. Get up and get me some food. I want a cupcake just like yours. No! Jeez, why did some girls think it was okay to treat guys like this? Frustrated, I went over there, picked up the cake from that boy's tray, and shoved it into her mouth. There, happy now? Poor thing, your arms must be so broken that you can't get food yourself. Let me feed you then. You're welcome. Are you crazy? 
You're dead meat today! She raised her hand about to slap me, but I quickly dodged, causing her to fall to the ground. As for me, I calmly sat down next to the boy and had my lunch. Sorry for wasting the cake. You can have my yogurt if you want. He's Kai, my first friend at this new school. He's witty, smart, and has a seriously impressive academic record. He was actually here on scholarship, which explained why he didn't quite fit in, just like me. I noticed how Blake seemed rather annoyed and kept staring at me. I bet he was just fed up with being teased by his friends, since I just totally ignored him. Oh, but he didn't give up that easily. The next morning, he showed up at mine to pick me up, but I'd rather run two laps around the schoolyard for being late than share a ride with you. Then at school, he tripped me up and then reached out his hand pretending to help. But between you and the floor, I picked the floor. He even waited for me at the school gates with a huge bouquet of roses, but I just took one look at them, then started coughing. Are you allergic to flowers? <coughs> nope. I'm allergic to immature and boring people, like you. Then I walked off. Ugh, as if every girl was going to fall for these lame tricks. This carried on for the next few weeks, but then one time, he approached me in the library while I was studying with Kai and handed me a necklace. I looked at it, then passed it back to him and turned to talk to Kai. Seriously? You're turning me down for this nerd? Kai's smart, gallant, and sophisticated. Unlike you, all you are is a troublemaker. Are you looking down on me? Oh, finally. I was wondering how much longer would it take for you to figure that out. Not to mention, you've not helped once with the English lit essay. You're in my group, but you probably just think the Grapes of Wrath is a rock band or something. So, if I can finish that essay on my own, will you go on a date with me? Fine, but it has to score an A, else you can forget it. And my trick worked. Blake actually completed the essay on his own. He's smart, but he's neglectful of his studies, and it's made him make mistakes. On being handed back the essay, Blake's face fell he got a B. And even though he knew it was over, he still stayed in class to reread the teacher's comments. It seemed like this was the first time he actually put in the effort to do something. <laughs> What's wrong? Still in denial of your failure? Blake turned away without looking at me. The rich boy who lost the game for the first time looked so cute. So I put a gift with a message in it on Blake's desk. Needless to say, he was over the moon. In it was a set of clothes I bought for him, and an invitation to a bar at the weekend. Why, you wonder? Oh, you'll see. That Saturday night, Blake showed up in the outfit I had gifted him, and looked anything but pleased. <laughs> I can't come in wearing this. It's so old-fashioned. My friends will laugh at me. You invited your friends, too? To prove that you won the bet, right? If you get that thousand dollars... Will I have a share? You already knew it? I was just joking at first. But now... Let's go inside now. Don't worry. We won't be here for long. I dragged him inside, and immediately, his friends didn't miss the opportunity to tease me. Did the fish get hooked? Yes, I'm trapped. Quickly give him a grand. His family is bankrupt and in dire need of money. Huh? What? You're lying. Look, he's wearing donated clothes. Even his branded clothes have been liquidated. I winked at Blake, and he immediately reacted. Lend me some money. I need a place to stay, a sports car, and pocket money too. At this point, his friends turned nasty and told him he no longer qualified to be in their group. You didn't have to do that. I already knew they only hung out with me for the money. But that's what people are just like. <sighs> Why would he think that? He must have never been cared for and loved properly. Get rid of that face. This is a date, after all. Let me make it up to you. A bar that matches this outfit. So I dragged Blake to our evening party. I told everyone that I brought a friend to lend a hand, and the elderly immediately made him do all sorts of things. Mrs. Hastings asked him to climb the tree to hang the string lights, 
Mr. Derbyshire called him to chop wood for the campfire, and Mr. Shaw wanted him to taste his homebrewed beer. Then the next second, Blake's already sitting on the drum throne. Huh, <laughs> it's been a long time since we had a young volunteer. That boy seems fine, doesn't he? I saw the way he looked at you. He's not suitable for me. I shrugged in response to her, and suddenly felt disappointed. Yes, I liked this different side to him, but we were still from different worlds. The next morning at school, I still saw Blake hanging out with his greedy friends. Looks like he hadn't learned his lesson. Frustrated that all my efforts were in vain, I swung open my locker. Hmm, what was this note? Meet me at the library at 6 p.m. when everyone has left. I have a surprise for you. B. I shouldn't be like this, right? Waiting for him at the library for hours until everyone left? Nervous and excited? But as soon as the last person left, the lights suddenly went out, and the library door slammed shut. What's happening? Could it be that the note wasn't from Blake? I screamed out of fear. That's right. I may excel at martial arts, but I hate the dark. With a shaking hand, I dialed the phone to call Blake, and then slumped down in fear and sobbed. At that moment, the sound of the door unlocking startled me. As soon as the door opened, I quickly ran to hug Blake. Are you okay? I can't believe Chloe did this. I told you not to get near them. Huh? This wasn't Blake's voice. Freya! Are you okay? Oh my god. It was Kai who opened the door to save me. But I thought that... I quickly let go of him, then ran away in embarrassment. That's strange. When I was in danger, the first person I thought of was Blake. Could it be that I... really liked him? At that moment, the phone rang. It was my dad. Mrs. Jones had suffered a heart attack and needed surgery immediately. But the surgery cost was so much. Where could we get that money? Ah, oh, yes. Blake's dad. So I called him. Hello, is this Mr. Morris? Blake stopped hanging out with his friends and did his homework. I really need the money now. Please, it's urgent. Are you bringing me out to trade with my dad? My God. It seems like Blake heard all the conversation. I... I... So, I'm just your money-making tool? And all this time you've trained me as your pet? It's not like that! We'll talk later. There's no time for your selfish thoughts right now. I gotta go! I ran like crazy to the hospital. My parents were desperate, and the money hadn't arrived yet. So I called Mr. Morris again. You said Blake had changed. If this is the case, then why did he just get fined for speeding and resisting police? Don't ever call me again. Don't worry, Freya. I'll sell the nursing home land to take care of Mrs. Jones. Everyone's agreed to move to the government nursing home. We sold our house, and now we live with Mrs. Jones in a new town. She's so much better now, but I do miss the other elderly people. Also, I miss Blake. I still keep in touch with Kai, and he told me that Blake has gone to some military school like his dad wanted. Well, that's unexpected from him. You should talk to that guy. Not about what you did, but confess your feelings to him. That will save you from regrets later. Then she patted me on the shoulder to comfort me. But I really don't have the courage to do it. I was feeling guilty. Mrs. Jones, you have a letter. Freya, look. It's the invitation to a nursing home concert. It's our concert, isn't it? Trembling, I took the invitation. What is this? I pushed Mrs. Jones's wheelchair to the door of the nursing home named Sunflower. When we walked in, we all burst into tears. Everyone was there. This is all Blake's doing. He's such a kind boy. He found us and built us a dream nursing home. You and Freya were the surprise gift we prepared for him, but as soon as he saw the two of you, he ran away. Hearing that, I rushed to the gate. A car passed me. My gut told me it was him. 
I ran after it and shouted in despair, Blake, wait! I like you! I really like you! But the car quickly went out of sight. I helplessly slumped down on the street, tears streaming down my face, and I still muttered, I really do like you. What are you saying? Say it louder. I turned around startled. It was Blake. He was in his military uniform and smiling at me fondly. It was a normal, boring day in the grocery store. I was stacking milk in the fridge when Camilla, my co-worker, came and said, Layla, you have to help me. I have this date tomorrow night, but I'm busy. Could you please go instead? Wait, what? I don't even know your date. Besides, I have a boyfriend. Lincoln, remember? Then she began explaining to me about this dating service, and she assured me it was 100% legit. It was mainly lonely men who just wanted some company. All I had to do was talk to them, and of course, there was a strict no-hugging or kissing policy. At the end of the date, they'd pay me. No thanks. No way I was going to do that. After my shift, I went home to see my landlady lingering in my doorway. She started yelling at me that I still owed her five months' worth of rent, and if I didn't pay it by the end of the week, she'd kick me out. I begged her to give me more time, but it was pointless. My god, what to do? Where could I get that much money on such short notice? Oh, wait a minute. What about Camilla's dating service? It looks like I was out of choices, so I called her and agreed to go on the date. So here I am, on my weird date night. I put the most basic dress I could find on. Oh boy, I sure felt nervous. I have no idea what to say and how to act. Oh, that must be him. My god, Camilla! How could she forget to mention that the guy was in his 50s? People would think he's my sugar daddy. Ugh! Keep it together, Layla. I couldn't back out now, as my home depended on it. So, I slowly approached the man. At first, he looked surprised. That figures, I mean, he was expecting Camilla. I explained the situation to him, and he wasn't mad or anything. He just smiled at me, and we started chatting. He's called Mr. Hall. He lost his wife two years ago, and ever since then, he's been feeling lonely and needed someone to talk to. So that's why he started using this service. Hmm. He was actually pretty easy to talk to. So the night quickly went by without any problem. After the date, he handed me an envelope and told me how grateful he was to me for listening to his burdens. I was itching to go home and open the envelope, but then he started going on about his heartbroken son. Suddenly, he was asking me if I'd talk to him. Obviously, I refused as this was a one-time thing to help out Camilla. Besides, I have a boyfriend. Speaking of which, he'll be so furious if he ever finds out about this. The next day, I paid the landlady two months' rent and assured her I'd have the rest with her soon. But to my shock, she just scowled at me and forced me to pay all at once. Well, guess where I am now? In a cafe, waiting for Mr. Hall and his son. Ugh. Oh, there he is. And that must be his son. Jeez, could he look any more annoyed? Hi, I'm Layla. Nice to meet you. Save it. I'm only here because he forced me to. So just let's get it over with. Layla, thank you for coming. This is my son, Leon. Please don't mind his attitude. Then Mr. Hall left us alone. Man, Leon was hard work. Any questions I asked him, he just shrugged or snorted. Then, when he finally spoke, he sarcastically said, So, Layla, I hope the money's worth it. What? How rude! Then he continued, you must be desperate. Don't you feel ashamed of yourself? Ah, oh, he was the rudest person I'd ever met. But yes, I was desperately in need of money. So I took a deep breath and started telling him about myself. When time ran out, I said goodbye to him and left. What an unpleasant experience, but at least that was the end of it, right? Wrong. As Mr. Hall asked me to meet him several more times. Who was I to argue? I mean, I needed the money. But Leon was getting on my nerves, as all he did was slouch in his seat, slurp his drink, and say nothing. So, it was down to me to do all of the talking. I began telling him all sorts of things. 
about my past, my family, and friends, and even about my future plans. And Leon just sat there listening to everything, supposedly. Luckily, it finally ended, and Mr. Hall paid me so I never had to meet Leon again. Because the last few weeks had been taken up with dating Mr. Hall and his son, I hadn't seen much of Lincoln. So, at the weekend, I invited him over to mine and cooked for him. We were sitting on the couch, hugging while watching a movie, when Lincoln said, in a serious tone, Layla, we need to talk. But then suddenly my phone rang. It was Mr. Hall. I quickly rushed to the balcony to pick up. He wanted me to be Leon's plus one at his eldest son's wedding, and he was willing to pay double? Ugh, that sounded awful, but... Besides rent, I also had to pay for college fees and food, and my measly income from the grocery store didn't come close to covering it at all, so I reluctantly agreed. When I returned inside, I asked Lincoln what he wanted to tell me. He hesitantly said that he had to go on a business trip for two weeks. Well, maybe it was for the best so I could go with Leon without worrying about my boyfriend. Ugh, I felt so guilty. I swear this would be the last time I was going to do this. Leon arrived to pick me up, and as soon as he saw my dress, he insisted I couldn't wear such an ugly thing. Ugh, he was so rude. I told him I had nothing else suitable, so he drove me to a dress boutique, then told the staff to bring the most beautiful dress in store to try on. Oh my, it was stunning. I was overwhelmed when I saw myself in the mirror. Well, I definitely looked amazing in it. And Leon must be thinking that too, because he couldn't take my eyes off me. Ugh, it's such a shame. I can't afford it. But then before I could stop him, he went ahead and paid for it. Ugh, how frustrating! I was sitting in the church, waiting for the wedding to start, while Leon flirted with some girls. Thank God Lincoln wasn't like that jerk. Then everyone went to their seats and the wedding began. The groom walked to the altar in this luxury-fitted suit. Man, it must be so nice to be rich. But isn't that... Is that... Lincoln? My Lincoln? Our eyes met, and he looked as shocked as I did. But instead of running to me and explaining everything, he just ignored me and continued with the wedding. I had to watch them saying their vows, exchanging rings, and kissing. I thought I was going to faint any minute now. Then at the wedding reception, Leon dragged me over to Lincoln and introduced me as his girlfriend. Awkward overload. And soon, some pretty girl distracted Leon again, so he chased after her. Then Lincoln immediately pulled me over to the stairwell. Why are you here with my brother? Were you cheating on me this whole time? Seriously? What about you? I'm not the one who just got married. Let me explain. It's not what it looks like. Right at that moment, Leon appeared and asked why we were here talking. I muttered out some story about trying to find the bathroom. Then I told Leon I had a headache and asked him to take me home. This was so confusing. How could my perfect boyfriend now be married to someone else? He kept on texting me saying he wanted to meet up and talk. I guess I needed to at least hear him out. The next day, I met him at the museum, where we had our first date. So, his wife, Sandra, is a daughter of an affluential businessman who owns one of the biggest corporations in town. Lincoln's family company is in big debt, so his dad forced him to marry Sandra in order to save the company. Believe me when I say I don't have any feelings for Sandra. It's just business. I only love you. Please don't leave me. I promise as soon as the company is back on track, I'll file for divorce. Yeah, I know you probably think I'm crazy, but I still love him too. Besides, if the marriage is only temporary so he can save this family business, then that's understandable, right? He kissed me goodbye and left. But after that, Lincoln changed. Every time I texted and called him, he told me he was busy and would call me back. But he never did. I guess married life was preoccupying him. As if this wasn't frustrating enough, I had to put up with Leon. He kept on appearing at my place and bothering me. One time he showed up drunk, complaining about his ex-girlfriend, who'd just married someone else. Yeah, obviously it's far from worse than my current boyfriend just getting married. I tried to kick him out, but he'd already fallen asleep on my couch. The next morning I went to the kitchen to see Leon holding a picture of me and Lincoln and asking why we were on it. So I just shrugged and explained that we were a couple. Leon started laughing and calling me a fool. We argued back and forth, and in the end, I made him leave. I don't care what everyone thinks. I believe Lincoln. Then a few days later, I was walking out of college when I saw Mr. Hall waiting for me. He gave a slight sigh, then said, I will make this short. Stay away from Lincoln. He's married now. Layla, I'm fond of you, but if you try messing with Lincoln's marriage, 
I won't hesitate in making things complicated for you. Oh my god. I can't believe Leon snitched on me. Ugh, what a giant baby. In anger, I took out my phone and gave him a piece of my mind. Oh my god. I can't believe you told your dad about me and Lincoln. You're such a jerk. Just leave us alone and mind your own business. If you trust Lincoln, then that's on you. But he's not as innocent as he makes out. He and dad would do everything for the company. What did that mean? I hung up without letting him say another word. This jerk didn't even try to cover up his action. <sighs> I couldn't just let them do this. I needed to fight for us. So the next day, I walked straight into Mr. Hall's office, even though his secretary tried to stop me. I told him right to his face that I would never give up on Lincoln despite his threats. And you know what? Forcing your son to get married just to save the company makes you a coward. Mr. Hall burst out laughing. Well, what came next was far from funny. Turns out it was Lincoln's idea to marry Sandra. Leon was right. Both of them would do everything for the company. Another thing Leon didn't tell Mr. Hall about Lincoln and me. He saw us talking at the wedding, so we hired someone to investigate us. I was totally wrong about Leon. Right at that moment, Lincoln walked in and stopped dead on seeing me. Layla, what are you doing here? You liar. I can't believe I trusted you. Please hear me out. I took the iced coffee from Mr. Hall's desk and splashed it in Lincoln's lying face. We're done. Overcome with emotions and feeling like a massive fool, I rushed to the nearest bar to drown my sorrows. I was about to down my fourth shop when a hand stopped me. <sighs> Can Lincoln just leave me alone? But when I looked up, it was Leon. Why are you so good to me? I mean, I blamed you for telling your dad. You should hate me. <laughs> because I like you. I felt like the room was spinning upon hearing his words. Then everything slowly came to light. Leon was devastated when his girlfriend broke up with him. But then he found out she did it to be with his brother. Yes, you heard me right. His ex was none other than Sandra. At first, Mr. Hall forced Leon to marry Sandra for the sake of the company. Even though Leon was crazy about her, he didn't want to marry her under those stipulations. Lincoln overheard their conversation. So to gain his father's trust, he charmed Sandra away from Leon. Oh my god, this family was crazy. I didn't want anything to do with any of them ever again. So I just rejected Leon's feelings, ran straight out of the bar, and cut off totally with all of them. So what now? Well, I graduated last month. So after that, I decided I needed a fresh start in a shiny new city. So far, so good. I have a new job, which I adore. Hey guys, I'm Feather, and I look just like any other 16-year-old, right? Actually, my life as a teenager is far from ordinary since I have hemophilia, a rare disease in which my blood doesn't clot properly, so even a simple graze could be fatal. My parents are so worried that I might hurt myself that they keep me safely shut away in this mansion. In fact, I've never left it. Money isn't a problem to them as they own this massive energy corporation, so to compensate for me not being able to go outside, they make sure I get anything I ask for. My giant playroom is cool, right? Not only that, but I also own a dressing room with hundreds of cute Lolita outfits and an enormous pantry full of my favorite snacks that I can enjoy at any time. You see, there's honestly nothing to complain about, except I suppose it does get a bit lonely sometimes. Until one morning, I was woken up by a screeching noise coming from downstairs. Are you kidding me? Do you want to burn my throat with this or what? What's going on here? I went over to the living room and was stunned to see a girl sitting way too comfortably on our couch. I was still trying to figure out who she was when she suddenly said, You, standing at the door, get me another glass of cool water. Now. Taken aback, I instinctively went to get her water. Then the girl finally looked up and seemed startled to see me. Oh my, I'm terribly sorry. I thought you were just one of the maids. Turns out she's Katie the daughter of Mr. and Mrs. Forger, the two scientists that are collaborating with our family's corporation. My parents arranged for them to stay here to facilitate the research on the upcoming project. When I told her about my life and condition, she seemed really surprised. Oh, Feather, it's as if you live in your own tiny world. There are already flying cars out there, and they've just invented time machines too. You're missing out on so much. Really? How come no one told me about this? <laughs> I'm just joking, silly. Whoa, you weren't kidding about not leaving this place, were you? 
Then she started telling me about some of her favorite things to do in the outside world, such as watching the latest movies in the cinema, going to the mall where she could actually try things on before buying them, or attending all the fun festivals. It all sounds so cool. We chatted for ages, then I showed Katie around the mansion. Her reaction when seeing my dressing room and the playroom was seriously priceless. <laughs> From then on, I spent lots of time with Katie, but my favorite part about being around her were her stories about school, where she got to learn new things and make a lot of friends. Seeing my excited expression, Katie immediately suggested that I talk to my parents about maybe letting me experience it myself. Actually, it doesn't hurt to try, right? So at dinner, I gathered my courage to say, Mom, Dad, I want to go to school. I understand that you're worried for me, so Katie will come along to protect me. Right, Katie? Oh, yes, that's right. Feather is in good hands, Mr. and Mrs. Adams. My parents seemed very hesitant, but after a whole lot of persuading, they finally agreed with conditions. We'll join the most prestigious school in the state and have our own chauffeur. As for Katie, to avoid any incidents occurring, I suggest you get rid of the long nails and jewelry, Katie. We went back to my room after dinner, and I just couldn't hide my excitement. Yes, we'll get to go to school together soon. What should I prepare? What would you recommend? But then I noticed Katie staring in sorrow at her newly done set of nails. I'm so sorry, Katie. Is there anything I can do to make it up to you? It's okay, Feather. What matters is that you're able to go to school and I'm so happy for you. It's bedtime anyways. I'll head back to my room now. I'm so lucky to have a friend like her. As I was indulging in my thoughts, a familiar voice startled me. Hey, I heard you two are going to school. Are you sure it's safe? Katie doesn't seem all that trustworthy. That is none of your business. You're just jealous that I've made a new friend while you're still lonely, aren't you? In case you're wondering, this guy is Liam, the butler's son. He was my childhood best friend and used to come to the mansion every day for homeschooling and to spend time with me. But we had some petty argument and I hadn't seen him since. Well, at least not until now. He was about to ramble about something else, but I slammed the door in his face. I wasn't going to let him ruin my mood. What I need to think about is my school day that's coming up. Oh my, it's so exciting, I really can't wait. Ah, we are going to Edgewood High today. So I decided to wear my favorite Lolita dress as Katie suggested. Oh, I almost forgot, Mr. Freddy. He's been my best friend since childhood and of course he had to come along with me on this big day. Katie also said I should try introducing him to everyone. That would help me make new friends faster. Such a brilliant idea. Whoa, we're finally here. Hey Katie, how do we find our lockers? Hey Katie, when is lunch? Hey Katie, do you know who's gonna teach us? Oh my god, Feather, stop asking, everyone's staring. Uh, I didn't even notice. It's probably because we're new. Hi, I'm Feather. Or maybe it's because of your extravagant outfit. Before I could say anything, someone spoke up. That's a lovely dress. Oh, you're right, they do seem to like my dress. <laughs> I waited for everyone in the room to settle, then confidently introduced myself. Hi everyone, I'm Feather, and this is my best friend, Mr. Freddy. As soon as they saw Mr. Freddy, everyone burst out laughing. I didn't know what was so funny, so I just awkwardly laughed along. After class, I asked Katie why our classmates laughed earlier, and what she told me was unbelievable. They were making fun of me. It's so sad to know, but I guess not everyone can be as nice as Katie. She also told me to dress down next time to attract less unwanted attention. It's a bit upsetting, but I guess I'll have to do what's best. So I listened to Katie's advice and ditched the OTT dress. Just like she said, people actually stopped staring at me. Here, hold this. You look really good holding books. Huh? That sounds kind of weird. But it's fine though. She probably wanted my help but was just too shy to ask. After the morning classes, I went to buy a bunch of lollipops. And that might look odd to Katie, so I let her know about how lollies are my special anxiety remedy. People here seem to be quite judgy, which got me a bit uneasy. You want one? Aw, poor you, but no thanks. By the way, I'll have lunch with David today. You know, the cute jock in our math class? So you're on your own this noon, okay? Then she quickly left without waiting for my response. I didn't know having lunch alone was so boring. Everyone has their own group, except for this one guy wearing a hoodie and a mask. H hi can I join you? But he didn't even reply, just stood up and moved to another seat. Did did I do something wrong? Feeling the anxiety taking over, I immediately took a lollipop to calm myself down. And it's doing a wonderful job at making me feel better. But suddenly, someone snatched it out of my hand. I chased after him, but slipped on someone's foot and fell hard on the floor. 
panicked, I burst out crying, and I heard the guy that took my candy say, Huh, huh, feather the toddler. Then everyone laughed at me again. Luckily, a guy spoke up. Stop this nonsense. What are you going to do if she's injured? Oh, wait, it's the weird guy from lunch. He checked on me to make sure everything was fine, then quietly went back to his seat. I didn't even have the chance to ask for his name before the teacher came in. This guy was so strange, but there was one thing I didn't understand. Why was Katie also laughing? Back home, Katie came to find me in the playroom, and I questioned her about the incident earlier, and she quickly apologized as she thought they were just joking. She then suggested going shopping and offered to buy me something to cheer me up, and so I agreed immediately. We went to the mall the next morning, and I had the best time. We had iced coffee and some delicious pudding. Katie also got me an adorable little hair clip, and so I bought her a bunch of new clothes in return. We were about to head home when Katie said, Hey Feather, um, I have a cousin whose sneakers are falling apart. Would it be okay if you helped me get him a new pair? Of course, anything for my best friend. Making my best friend happy was the most wonderful feeling in the world. I'm so grateful to have such a lovely person like her to come into my life. But then the next day, I walked into class to see Katie being all lovey-dovey with the boy who took my lollipop. So that's the David that she mentioned, and on his feet were the brand new sneakers that were supposed to be for her cousin. Why is he wearing the shoes I bought? Then Katie pulled me outside and explained profusely, Feather, calm down. The, the shoes were too big for my cousin, so I gave them to David. I didn't lie to you, I promise. Fine. Please just don't let me see him wearing them again. I felt really bad since Katie seemed really sad after hearing what I said. At that moment, David approached me. What's up, toddler? You got a problem with my new kicks? I froze in fear. Then, thankfully, an announcement came through the speaker. David Peterson, please come to the principal's office immediately. Turns out he's in trouble for spray painting a teacher's car. At least someone already helped me teach him a lesson, but that wasn't all. A few more of my classmates also got detention for cheating on the math quiz yesterday, while some others got caught skipping classes. It was such a crazy morning. It's as if someone was trying to play the hero here. Finally, it's lunch break. Hoped things would be better in the afternoon, but... Huh? What is this? A poster of me? It also says underneath, Feather the toddler is the snitch. Katie took a look at it and said that the best way to deal with these kinds of jokes was just to play along. Um, I'm not sure about that, but it seems like the only way now. And so, I climbed on an empty chair in the cafeteria and started speaking loud and clear. Mm, may I have everyone's attention, please? Hi, I am Feather the Toddler, and I am proud of it. Instead of getting the response I'd hoped for, what I got back was food. The whole cafeteria was laughing and throwing food at me. I covered my face, trying to dodge it, but the floor got slippery from all the greasy food, so I ended up falling. Oh no, I scratched myself. I could only lay on the ground out of pain. People finally stopped as they saw me bleed. All I could vaguely hear was a familiar voice calling my name. I woke up in the hospital to find Liam sitting next to me. Feather, you're awake. Do you feel pain anywhere? Well, Liam? Why are you here? Where's Katie? Katie? You're still worried about Katie? She's the one who was behind all this. She told the principal about your classmates and told everyone it was you to make them hate you. What? How is that possible? Turns out, the guy who was always wearing a hoodie and mask was Liam. Liam had always been suspecting something shady in Katie's behavior. So, after failing in warning me about her, he decided to look out for me himself instead. I cried and tried to hug him despite the pain on my arm. Then, Liam showed me a shocking video of Katie talking trash about me to everyone. Oh, why was Feather carrying my books, you ask? It's because her parents work for my family's corporation and she'll do anything I tell her to as long as I give her some money. <laughs> Seeing the anger and also disappointment in my eyes, Liam calmed me down and said he had a plan to expose my so-called best friend. When I returned to school a few days later, I stormed straight over to Katie. It's you! You're behind it all! I already know everything. <laughs> Stop being ridiculous, Feather. You got busted and now you're trying to blame me. Drop the act. No one's falling for it. At the end of class, Katie suddenly gathered everyone. People, head over to the lecture hall. I have something very interesting to show you guys. Oh boy, I wonder what else she has planned. Liam and I quickly followed the crowd and found Katie standing on stage. Oh, Feather, I'm glad you're here. This is about you after all. The screen started playing a video of me sitting on my swing, playing with my dolls, and taking armfuls of candy out of the pantry. 
Do you see that, everyone? Feather is just a toddler in a teenager's body. Such a weirdo. I was waiting for everyone to start laughing, but the crowd stayed completely silent. Then Katie hesitantly continued. Not only that, she's also the poser who snitched on us. Then, to her surprise, the angry crowd started booing and shouting at Katie, saying she is the evil snitch. Then they turned to me. Your rooms are actually pretty cool. I wish I had a snack pantry like that. It's so awesome. Katie sounded panicked as she continued talking more trash stuff about me, but no one listened. Turns out, Liam had set up a group chat in which he'd posted proof of Katie's actions, including the video of her talking to David, and also pictures of her coyly walking out of the principal's office after she must have snitched on everyone, and her putting up that mean poster about me. Katie, you're the one embarrassing yourself. Everyone knows that you're a snake in the grass. I trusted you, and what I get back are all these lies and schemes. I feel so ashamed for ever calling you a friend. As Katie looked around at the unimpressed looking crowd, she realized her game was up and quickly fled the scene. Later on, we arrived home to see my angry looking parents standing next to Katie's mom and dad who had all their luggage packed ready to move out. Yes, Liam had already told them everything. In the end, Katie's parents made her apologize to me. Only after a lot of persuading did my parents let them keep their jobs. I never saw Katie again, but I did make a bunch of new friends that I invite around sometimes. The snack pantry is a big hit. <laughs> Now, I wear whatever I like without worrying about being judged. Most of all, I'm enjoying my school life, and it's all thanks to the help of my trusty soulmate, Liam. Oh God! Can I not save one from the pitiless wave? Is all that we see or seem but a dream within a dream? According to the poet... This world and all existing life is an illusion of sorts, as reality doesn't exist. Philosophers refer to it as dream argument and dream hypothesis. What? What an interesting lesson! By the way, look at how there's a ray of sunshine coming through the curtains. That's so pretty. This kind of weather indeed puts you in such a dreamy mood, huh? Yeah, right. But remember... There is no rose without thorns. That sunshine may look glorious, but it will harm your eyes. Yeah, I know. The maids always tell me that sunlight is the enemy for me, for my beautiful, sensitive blue eyes. Looking at it once, and I'll never be able to see anything again. That's why I've never been allowed to leave this castle. My maids all look identical in those masks, don't they? When I was a child, of course, I once got curious, and I pulled one of them off. As punishment, I was denied dessert for a whole week. And worse still, it wasn't worth it, as the maid's face was exceedingly ordinary. The masks looked far better. Anyway, I suppose all that matters is that they take great care of me. Each day they bring me food, water, and new clothes. I was sipping my leek and potato soup when I heard a scream. Let me out! Curious, I went and hid in a corner and saw two maids attempting to lock the screaming girl into a room. Hmm, I've never seen that girl in this castle before. I wonder if she's from the outside world. Poor her. It looks like she can't control herself. The world out there is scary. Perhaps it has sent her into madness. It's much safer here in the castle. I can play all day, paint, knit, and read. Oh, how peaceful. Hmm. But I still couldn't stop thinking about that poor girl. I wonder what will happen to her. The screaming didn't stop, and my curiosity got the best of me. So I snuck into the girl's room. Shh. Stop screaming. No one is listening. Ugh, who are you? Uh... Um, my name is... Mistress. What's yours? <laughs> Mistress isn't a name. Are you stupid? It's just a name. Everybody here calls me that. This girl was so stubborn. She seemed to be wary of everything. Poor little outside world girl. After much persistence, she told me that her name was Nora. I was about to ask her why she was here when suddenly two maids appeared and dragged me away. Mistress, you should not interact with this wicked girl. 
and you mustn't be late for your embroidery class. <sighs> it was nice to finally get to talk to a girl my own age, and I must admit that given her brash nature, I found Nora rather interesting. During class, I kept thinking about how I could sneak out and see her again. Ah! Ouch! That annoying girl screaming made me prick my finger. I ran out to check on her, but the maids immediately blocked my way. Perhaps I could talk some sense into her. Trust me, the last time I spoke to her, she was acting totally normal. The desperate maids exchanged looks, then let me go to her. As predicted, when I approached Nora, she stopped screaming. Hey, it's Ariana. That's my real name. Screaming never works here. Just pretend you're listening to my words, then I'll help you out. The maids were quite surprised when Nora immediately calmed herself down and showed signs of following directions, so they let us be and left. We began to chat, and ever since then, the maids let me see Nora every day. She told me how before her mother died, she gave Nora an address to find her biological father, who she'd never met before. Nora's grandma helped her set up a meeting with him and took her to the meeting point. She was so nervous, but happy at the same time to finally meet her dad. And at first, he was as kind and charming as she imagined. But then unexpectedly, right after they said goodbye to her grandma, he brought Nora here and let those masked people lock her up. But you're fortunate to be here, as it's safe. No! It's not. That's just what they want you to believe. Then Nora told me about the outside world, about her friends, school, and shopping malls. Every day, she even drew me paintings of the outside world, of beautiful memories with her family, her mom who passed away, and also her dad, even though she only met him once. Family? What is that? All I'd ever known were the faceless maids. The next day when I visited Nora as usual, she suddenly told me, Sis, we need to get out of here. What do you mean? This is my home. No, it's not. It's a prison. Who on earth stays inside for 14 years, huh? It's because of my eyes. I'll go blind if I go out there. My maids only want the best for me. That's why they keep me here. Are you crazy? You've been tricked. Just think about it. Do you know who gave birth to you? And why did that person leave you with these people? Or are these people the ones who took you away from your mom? Don't you want to find out the truth? This was my home, wasn't it? But thinking about what Nora just said, as well as the outside world that she rambled about every day, I suppose it would be interesting to experience it for myself. I'd just have to try my best to protect my eyes. So, I snuck into the housekeeper's room and stole the front door key. As we approached the main hall leading to the door, we saw a masked woman standing by a man. In his arms was a young girl, deep asleep. H huh? Th that's my dad. What? Did he come to pick you up or something? Don't you see that they're all in the same boat? And she's the ringleader! I peered closer at them and spotted the masked woman's silver hair and luxurious dress. Isn't that my tester? She lives in the Grand Suite and visits me weekly to assess my learning and etiquette. Mom, how are you going to handle this case? Just leave her in the empty room at the end of the hallway. As for Nora, I think she'll settle in properly in a week or so. Then we can start her etiquette and culture lessons. Which Nora? Ah, uh, I remember. Besides, you should restrict yourself a bit. Ariana, Nora, and now this child? Don't let the list of your illegitimate children be as long as your arm. Then you can just throw them away somewhere. Why bother raising them? They are my grandchildren, after all. They can't end up like those street rats. And who knows? They may become useful. But this has to be the last one. We can't risk Laura finding out about us. It would ruin our family's affluent name. Do you understand? I know, but fear not. 
as my wife is kind and foolish. She is completely clueless to these matters, thanks to your smart move. So we were this heartless man's illegitimate children? And because of his deceit, he was forcing us to live in darkness? I don't want to be locked up and lied to any longer. We needed to escape. From then on, Nora kept her act up and behaved like an angel, which eventually led to us being allowed to study together. And today is the day. Oriana is having a convulsion! We must take her to the hospital as soon as possible! However, the maids called the doctor to come round here instead. Oh, no! The plan was to escape when we were taken outside. If the doctor came here, he'd discover that my rashes were painted on and our plan would be disclosed. Okay, plan B. I was still lying on the bed playing the whole role of a patient while Nora locked the door of the room and went to the bathroom screaming. Help! There's a giant spider in here! As expected, the doctor went to check. The Nora immediately locked him in. Then we quickly took the knotted string made of the fabrics and embroidery class out from under the bed and then escaped through the window. Ah! I got my head between my hands as soon as I landed. I didn't expect it to be so bright outside. It's burning my eyes, Nora! What? There's no time for your hysterics. You'll be done if you're stuck here anyway. Just open your eyes and run! Hurry up! But I'm scared! Huh? Nothing happened. My eyes seemed fine. But no time to celebrate as then I saw... Oh my god. A couple of maids were chasing after me. Nora pulled my hand and ran towards the garden. Fortunately, we were already out of their sight when... Woof! Woof! A huge hound appeared out of nowhere and growled at us. I crouched down in a bush and watched Nora wave the dog closer, and then pat him. What? Magic! The dog suddenly became unusually obedient and led us to a secret place. A dog-sized passageway! I hesitated, but seeing the maids gaining on us, I reluctantly squeezed through it real quick. I can't believe I'm putting my destiny in the hands of this reckless girl. She said we had to get to her grandmother's house right away for help. What are those things running back and forth on the road? Why are they making that loud, annoying noise? Hmm. And why is Nora waving her arms about? Did she want them to stop? Too bad nobody did, as she's no princess. We kept wandering until we saw something which Nora called a truck parked on the roadside. She rushed over, then helped me onto the back of it. Oh, it was full of bananas. I stuffed my mouth full of them to ward off my starvation, while the scenery kept changing. That thing stopped, and we immediately got off before getting caught. I held her tight, frightened of all the people around us. They kept staring at me. And what kind of style was that? They all looked very peculiar. Maybe they were just commoners. Then we used our power to demand a man to take us to Nora's grandma's. Oh, it was exhausting. What? The outside is actually beautiful, sparkling with all those lights. And there are exhibitions of everything in the world, such as food, toys, flowers, and even creatures. Yes, everything. But the most important thing was that my eyes didn't get sore looking at those shiny things at all. Nora's grandma seems kind, but her home is full of the strangest of items. While Nora told her what had happened, I found myself bewitched by the talking black box on the wall. Suddenly, Nora's grandma led us to her far smaller truck and took us to somewhere called the Cops. They all wore these same funny outfits and bombarded us with dozens of confusing questions. And what exactly is an ID card? A few days later, there was news that the cops had caught my so-called dad, grandma, and maids also. As predicted, he was a womanizer, so when his lovers asked him to support his children, he was so afraid that his wife would find out that he took these children and locked them away in the castle. They're currently awaiting something called a trial, 
which Nora says is where bad people get their comeuppance. Whoa, the world outside is so busy. I didn't realize there'd be so many unmasked faces. And that strange talking box still startles me, especially when someone is holding a weapon. Nora says when I've adjusted to my new life a little more, I'll start school with her. And one day I'll even learn how to drive one of those smaller trucks. But firstly, she's teaching me how to dress like other people do and use this brick to communicate with them. This world is puzzling, but I'm sure with Nora's help, I'll soon find my feet. Even if it's just so I can learn how to reply to my dashing neighbor. I can't believe I'm standing here in the middle of this frenzied concert with a crowd of crazy fans cheering for this Isaac guy, who I don't even care about. Hi, I'm Hazel, by the way. When I agreed with my friends to go on this road trip all the way to Carolina to attend a skydiving festival, well, this wasn't exactly what I was expecting. Yeah, that's them, Ivy and Zoe, the girls who tricked me into thinking this, their idols concert, was the opening of the festival. There I was, eagerly awaiting some amazing aerial display or something, but instead, I was stuck in Fanville. Ugh, why were they so loud? My hearing better not be permanently damaged from this. And as you can see, being the only calm one here, they placed me in charge of their fan cams. Worse still, why did I specifically order these custom matching hoodies for us all? It made me look like I was part of these groupies. Finally, this din was over, but I was stuck amongst the slow walking fans. And where were my friends? I couldn't even call them as my battery had died. Hmm, I'll just get a taxi back to our Airbnb rental, then contact them from there. I'm too exhausted anyway. Let's just get out of this place ASAP. Forget about this chaotic night, as I'll be having a bird's eye view of the world at the actual Fall Fest tomorrow. And that's all that matters. Wow, this festival had everything going for it, from attentive service, amazing live music, and great food. It was so worth enduring that awful concert for. Everything was going great, until I saw Ivy's panicked face. Girls, it's our beloved Isaac. After the concert last night, he disappeared with a mysterious girl. Look at this hoodie. Does it seem familiar to you? Oh my god. That's one of our custom-made group hoodies. Could it be? I could clearly see Zoe's suspicious gaze on me and Ivy. What's that look for? Are you suspecting me? Well, whatever. It wasn't me, that's for sure. Ivy, you took way too long to get back to the car last night. As for you, Hazel, you were unreachable for ages. Jeez, my battery died. I told you both this. And I have nothing to do with your precious idol. Besides, if any of us did run away with him, then we'd hardly be standing here, would we? Anyway, you two can stay here and doubt each other if you want, but I'm going skydiving. Then I stormed off. It's so frustrating that I've been dragged into this. My phone only died thanks to their stupid fan cams. That's enough. <sighs> Let's just forget about it. I won't let anything ruin this moment. Guys, look! I'm amongst the clouds! 10,000 feet above the ground and my breath is literally taken away! No matter how many times I've done this, it still feels just as thrilling as the first time! This adrenaline rush was crazy! Whoa, that was amazing! Thank goodness I managed to capture some spectacular footage of the beautiful city of Chester. Hang on. When I was close to landing, my camera spotted a familiar face. Zoe. Um... Wasn't she meant to be preparing to fly? So why was she talking to someone in the parking lot? It was really weird. Looking closer, the strange man was... Isaac, the missing singer. I didn't see it wrong, did I? I immediately called Ivy and we quickly ran to the parking lot. Gotcha! You better have a good reason for this. Isaac, are you really... So, you're the one who ran away with him last night? Zoe couldn't say a word at that point, and kept trying to avoid eye contact with us. But eventually, under the harsh questioning from Ivy, she found her voice and told us everything. 
So last night when we were separated in the after concert chaos, Zoe was trying to find us when she accidentally bumped into a guy in disguise. Guess what? Yep, it was none other than Isaac McGuire in the flesh. She almost screamed out his name, so he immediately covered her mouth and dragged her away. Realizing that Isaac was being chased, Zoe then put her hood up to cover her face and followed him without a question. This hectic schedule was just too much. I can't even remember the last time I had proper time for myself anymore. I need a break. Ugh, and I didn't care. But Ivy sure looked like she was going to drop a tear for her poor idol any second now. Well, you see? It's an emergency. I couldn't help but give him a hand. Then, we've already parted ways last night, but... But my manager has been able to track me down, so we had to run away ASAP. All I have with me is this phone, so I really need your help. And that's when we start to hear some whispers. Someone seemed to have recognized Isaac, so without delay, we immediately jumped into the car. But, huh? Who on earth was sitting next to me? Jeez, this girl's makeup was so flashy, and her perfume was so strong it made my throat lump up. Siren! You're Siren, aren't you? Oh, I adore your chemistry with Isaac in the movie. It's like you guys were born for each other. But, wait, are you two running away together? It turned out that the flamboyant girl was Siren, an emerging actress who was filming a movie with Isaac. Looking at the way she blushed while Isaac remained silent and didn't deny it, it was clear that they were a couple who took their romance off screen. Hmm, busy schedule? Exhausted? Nonsense. Obviously, he was just making excuses to spend time with his girlfriend. Oh my, you're even more beautiful in real life. Your face is a gift from heaven. OMG, Ivy needed to stop. Looking at Siren's smug face, she was clearly big-headed enough without any more flattery. But nope, Ivy continued gushing out a river of compliments at her. I mean, does she seriously like this actress that much? Um, your nose is so pretty from up close. Where'd you get your nose job? Hearing that, Siren immediately stopped smiling and covered her nose in annoyance, which almost made me burst out laughing. Chin shaving surgery, lip filler, nose job. How can she even act with such a stiff face? Sorry to bother everyone, but staying at a hotel is not a good idea right now. Can you guys help us find alternative accommodation? Yes, yes, yes. I volunteer to help you two. I watched in disgust as Ivy and Zoe frantically called and texted their acquaintances, but no one could help. Suddenly, Ivy turned to me and gave me her puppy dog eyes look. Hazel, you're our last hope. You must help us, please. Oh, not that again. Ivy knows I can't say no to her when she makes that pleading face. Okay, fine. Even though I didn't want to, I agreed to let them come to my family's suburban house for a few days. It'll only be a few days. I didn't want any of my family members to know I'd been there. Wow, I can't believe I hadn't been here in 10 years. This place held some of my childhood's good memories, but also some not so good ones, especially one haunting one. <sighs> um, why didn't you tell us that your family is loaded? It would be so nice to live in a huge mansion like this. But it seems like your family doesn't come here often. It's so cold and cheerless. Yeah, he's right. Ever since that day, this place was never a home to me anymore, but just a hollow house of gloom. I was still lost in my thoughts when a deafening sound of something breaking came from upstairs. We all rushed upstairs to see what all the noise was about, and found Siren standing there in my parents' bedroom, a broken vase at her feet, and worse still, she was wearing my mom's dress. Take it off right now! Siren just shrugged, stepped over the broken vase pieces, then strutted across the room, and even stopped to pose at the end. Poof, it's just an old dress. Why so serious? I was so furious that on her walk back, I tripped her up, causing her to fall flat on the floor. Isaac hurriedly helped her up, and she hid behind his back and did her whole crocodile tears act, saying I was picking on her. 
Oh, please. I'd had quite enough of this drama queen for one day, so I was about to lunge at her to teach her a lesson, but Isaac blocked me. Excuse, Siren. That was immature of her, but I suggest you should calm down first. That's right, Hazel. The two of them didn't bring any personal belongings. Anyway, Siren was just a bit careless. You'd better watch your girlfriend closely. Change your clothes. Never touch my mom's stuff again. Got it? Now I'll arrange the rooms for all of us. Well, there were only two usable bedrooms here, since most of them were dusty and unfurnished. So I took the couch and gave one room to my friends, and the other room to the loving couple. But as Siren gave a satisfied look and took Isaac's hand to lead him to their room, he just shook her away and said I could have the bed, and he'd take the couch. No, the couch is mine! I didn't want to share a bed with her! But Isaac ignored my protests and plopped down onto the couch to claim it. Zoe and Ivy quickly scurried upstairs. They caused this mess, yet it's clear neither of them was bold enough to share a room with Siren. What a bunch of annoying, obnoxious celebs! Anyway, I was exhausted. It was time for me to hit the sack. That girl better not snore. Siren started playing some dumb white noises, then instantly fell asleep. Me, on the other hand, even after turning off that weird lullaby of hers, I kept on tossing and turning. Ugh! It was no use. Sleep wasn't happening. So, I left the room to get some air. I was about to go downstairs to get some water, when I heard a piano playing. Oh, heart and soul. It had been so long since I'd heard these beautiful melodies. The music carried me to a room where the silhouettes of a man passionately playing the piano came into sight. Oh, memories. I loved nothing more than sitting next to my dad and playing happy songs with him. But then, everything fell apart. And I hadn't touched the piano since, well... <sighs> until today, I sat down next to him and let my fingers glide over the keys. I was immersed in the harmonious melodies of the music and let the notes take me back to the past until a scream snapped me out of it. What on earth are you two doing? Hey guys, I want to tell you about my most memorable summer. It involves a parent-free house, the girl of my dreams, and my little bro Silas's massive secret. Actually, Silas doesn't want me telling you about it. But this story is too fun to keep it for ourselves. So stay tuned. Let me tell you what happened. Imagine the scene. I'm there eating corn dogs when my parents announce they're going away on vacation for their 20th wedding anniversary. That means I'll be home alone all week long in our big farmhouse surrounded by vast fields. Sounds great, right? But wait. It got even better when my childhood friends who had now lived in another city were also back in town for the summer vacation. Of course, my parents let me invite them over to stay while they're away. That's how close our families were. Oh God, I haven't seen Carl in over a year. And his sister, Ellie, too. Yep, I wouldn't say that I had the biggest crush on my best friend's sister, but there's that. Anyway, this was going to be my summer paradise. But you know, man proposes, God disposes. It turns out my parents weren't taking Silas with them. Because they thought I was old enough to look after my little brother. Ugh, what a bummer. How was I meant to impress Ellie when I had a whining kid to care for? I needed to think fast. So as soon as we waved our parents off, I passed my PS4 to him and said, Silas, you can play on it, but only if you promise to do as I ask and stay out of my way. Of course, he agreed. I mean, what eight-year-old boy wouldn't want to play Fortnite? I checked on him now and then and gave him juice and snacks. Other than that, I had plenty of time to spend hanging out with Carl and Ellie. Things were going well for the first few days and nothing beats being around your best bud and your crush all day long. Whoa, <laughs> just, I just couldn't take my eyes off Ellie. She seemed to have gotten even more beautiful. Then, on one evening, we were sitting outside, stargazing. It was so romantic, especially when Carl thought it was dull and left us to go to bed first. I was about to do the whole yawn and stretch out my arm to wrap around her shoulders trick when Silas appeared and squeezed in between us. I glared at him and through gritted teeth asked him what he wanted. He just shrugged and said, Edward, I'm bored of that game now. I want ice cream. Ellie laughed, then led him off to get some. What? 
How dare that little dweeb ruin my smooth moves? What a buzzkill! I needed to come up with a new trick to handle this annoying kid. So, the next morning, I told Silas that if he wanted to download a new game of his choice, he needed to go into the field and find a corn cob with exactly 200 seeds on it. He looked like he was going to cry, but he went off to the field. Oh, how smart I am, sending my little brother on a wild goose chase. I expected him to give up after a few hours, but nope. He was out there searching for it all day. He even managed to drag Carl along to help him. In the end, he still had to leave empty-handed. Anyway, I have to thank my stupid brother for helping me to have such a good afternoon with Ellie. That night, we all sat together in the living room and told creepy ghost stories. I hoped Ellie would freak out so much she nestled into my lap for protection. So I told him about the empty house up the road, which was also our family's property. My grandparents used to live there, but now it had been abandoned for over 40 years. There were plenty of rumors about it being haunted. One farmer said he saw a ghostly woman by the window, but she vanished into thin air. And someone else said they saw a spooky figure float out of the house and chase after them. Ellie chuckled, then said, Ooh, spooky. We should go and check it out. What? This wasn't what I had in mind. In fact, she didn't seem afraid at all. I didn't want to go in there. It was old and creepy, and just thinking about it freaked me out. Luckily for me, Silas strongly discouraged us by saying that he had heard someone crying in that house, and our parents didn't allow us to go there. And then, from nowhere, I felt the chilly wind blow over me with a whistle, which made my hair stand on end. And boom! The lights went out, leaving the whole room in darkness. Everyone was confused. What on earth was going on? I didn't want to die now, not when I haven't even told my crush my feelings yet. I was lost in terrifying thoughts when the lights came back on, and everyone else immediately bursted out laughing. OMG, I found myself sitting on Ellie's lap with my head between my hands. It turns out that my evil little brother was the one who turned the lights off as a prank. How humiliating. Oh well, at least Ellie changed her mind about wanting to check the house out. But then, over the next few days, weird things started happening. I went to grab a snack for my secret loot under my bed, but what's this? All of the Snickers bars had gone. It couldn't have been Silas, as he hated Snickers bars, right? Then we were watching a movie. Ellie started shivering, so being the awesome guy I am, I went to get a blanket for her, but... Huh? All of the blankets had gone? When I went back and told Carl and Ellie about it, Ellie said that was odd, as the other day she couldn't find her pajamas, and Carl's pack of Gatorade had vanished too. So, is there a real ghost in my house? As for my bro, he was acting like he was haunted. He barely talked anymore, and for three days in a row, at 6 p.m. on the dot, he disappeared out of the house for hours. This was so strange, I mean, that's the time slot for his favorite show, and he seriously wouldn't miss Adventure Time without a good reason. For me, it's great that Silas isn't at home, but since I'm the older brother, I still have to keep an eye on him, as mom and dad wouldn't have been best impressed if I'd lost him or something. That night, he mysteriously disappeared again. I was quite curious, so I went to look for Silas, but couldn't find him anywhere. Panicked, I raced around the garden calling out his name. Finally, I felt a hand pounding on my shoulder. My heart was in my mouth. I turned around to see Silas standing there sweating. I shouted at him, You can't just run off without saying a word! Where have you been? But Silas calmly replied, So what? It's my business, not yours. Then he ran straight inside. He gotta be kidding me. Okay, then if secrecy was the game he wanted to play, then I wouldn't mind being the detective either. I had to figure this out. So, I gathered Ellie and Carl and came up with a genius plan. The next day at lunch, as planned, Silas entered the kitchen and everything was set. I placed an eye-catching candy-filled jar on the table, and as expected, Silas immediately picked up a handful and put them right in his mouth. Oh, just look at his happy face. He had no idea what I had in store for him. Right after that, we entered the room. Not wanting to get caught eating food on the sly, Silas quickly hid under the table. And of course, we pretended not to know he was there. Then I held up that candy jar and said, Guys, guess what? I've ordered these pills online. It's the legendary invisible candy that makes it impossible for people to see me. Carl acted surprised. Unbelievable! How did you get this? I heard it's such a hit that it was sold out everywhere. Then Ellie asked me how long we could disappear if we ate these candies. I replied, I think if we just eat four to five candies, we can disappear for 45 minutes. We continued our skit, then I said I had to leave the candy jar here. 
so tomorrow we can try it and go out pranking everyone with our new superpower. I winked, and everyone nodded. Now, where did Silas go again? I asked, and everyone shook their heads. Then I picked up an apple and purposely dropped it on the floor, then immediately peered underneath the table to look for it while pretending not to see Silas down there. He looked absolutely amazed, trying not to make any sound. Now Silas thought he was truly invisible. He crawled out then did all sorts of funny things in front of us, from dancing, shaking his butt, and cartwheeling across the room. It was so hard to keep a straight face and ignore his existence. Then, at 6 p.m., Silas left the house with a backpack on. But because he thought he was invisible, he ran straight past us without hesitation and didn't forget to stick his tongue out at me before leaving. Hmm, <laughs> this idiot. We followed him, and guess what? He went to the abandoned house. We hid behind a tree to watch, and suddenly the door creaked open. I was a little creeped out, so I clung to Ellie's arm. Someone ran over to him. A little girl. Oh no, was it a, g a, g a ghost? Ellie said, OMG, she's in my clothes! I looked closer and realized she wasn't a ghost, but in fact, was a real-life girl. So Silas hid that little girl in our abandoned house, and that's why he kept telling us over and over again not to come here. Since Silas thought that he was invisible, he kept running around her saying, You can't see me, right? He looked so funny as the little girl was too bewildered to understand anything. And right then we barged in shouting, Gotcha! Well, well, well. Look who's the big guy hiding his girlfriend here. I pulled out Silas's backpack, which was filled with Snickers bars and other missing items. Silas was shocked and sputtered, I, it's, uh, it's not what you think. The little girl burst into tears and said, I'm Sally. I got lost, so Silas helped me. Silas said that he had met Sally one day on the cornfield. She was alone and hungry, so he brought her here and took care of her. He didn't dare tell us because he was afraid that we would make fun of him. Oh, I didn't think that my usual foolish brother was able to do such a good thing. So I hugged them and said, I don't blame anyone, Silas. You did a very good job. And Sally, you will be safe here. Take her to our house and I will call someone for help. Fortunately, the police said that they were also looking for a missing child. And the next day, Sally was reunited with her parents. It turned out she was at a crowded train station when she ended up lost. Confused, she followed a man with the same shirt as her father. And that's how she ended up lost in our fields. Yeah, my brother is a bit annoying at times, but he's a good kid with a kind heart. Since then, we've grown closer. Hi everyone, Jack here. I'm 17 and I live with my mom, dad, and sis. We're pretty much a normal family. I suppose I do okay at school. I'm not super popular or anything, as I am a little on the shy side, but I'm not unpopular either. I'm really good at sports studies, and I definitely want to pursue this further when I go to college and stuff. Anyway, I want to tell you about my best friend Danny, and the girl of my dreams, Amy. I first met Danny at the age of 10. We were both at the local pool, and back then, I was energetic, and well, I did a lot of stuff without thinking it through. I started splashing about in the pool, and soon I realized I couldn't put my feet on the ground. I couldn't swim. So, yeah, this was bad. I began to panic and tried shouting out for help, but a load of water ended up in my mouth. Then Danny appeared and helped me over to the shallow end. Turns out he was new to town and was starting at the same school that I went to. After that, we became best friends. Danny's this effortlessly cool, stylish, and handsome guy. He was always more popular than me, and all the girls liked him, but still, he chose to be friends with me. Being around him was great fun. We hung out and goofed around. There's this girl from school called Amy. She's popular and beautiful. She always wears these pretty dresses, and well, she just stands out. Problem is, I wasn't the only one to notice this. Practically every boy at school had a crush on her. I didn't think I stood a chance with her, but then the school picnic happened. I ended up in the same group as her, so I went over to her and tried to talk. I felt so nervous that I couldn't get any words out. Then I tripped over a branch and accidentally fell into her arms. In that moment, I imagined we looked into each other's eyes and she could see how much I liked her. Then we'd kiss and date and marry and live happily ever after. But yeah, that wasn't reality. In real life, I was stiff as a log and was so embarrassed. I quickly snapped out of it, got up and muttered out, sorry. She giggled and said, no problem. I hope you didn't hurt yourself. 
Amazingly, we started chatting after that. Things quickly changed between Amy and me. We talked a lot on Messenger, and I often sat with her at lunch. She was so fun to be around, and I loved spending time with her. Then we started dating. I often had to pinch myself to convince myself that yes, I really was dating the most beautiful girl in school. We both loved nature, so we often spent our weekends going for walks and exploring new places. Our first kiss happened in my room. We were meant to be working on our science project, but I couldn't stop staring at her. She was just so beautiful. So I leaned over and kissed her. It was like fireworks were going off around us. <laughs> Talk about magical. After that, we became pretty much inseparable. I often went out to restaurants with her family, and she regularly came over for dinner with mine. Things were amazing. She was my princess. With her around, I felt so happy, and I couldn't imagine my life without her in it. Then one night, she texted me, I love you. This made me smile, and I sent back, I love you too, Amy. Then, to my surprise, she messaged back, What is love anyway? I didn't understand what she meant, but before I can send another message asking this, she sent me a video of her with Danny, my best friend Danny. Then she messaged me, this is what real love looks like. Couldn't believe what I just saw. I immediately threw my phone across the room. I was so heartbroken. How could she do this to me and with my best friend? I cried days and nights. It was horrible. I felt like I'd never be happy again. I rarely cry, so my family was really worried and tried every way to console me, but nothing they said or did could cheer me up. Worse still, I was dreading going back to school and having to see them together. They didn't make it easy for me. As soon as I got to my locker, I saw them there, kissing. Word got around that they were very much in love. So much for her ever loving me. It hurt so much. Danny didn't seem to bother that he'd hurt me. That's the problem with Danny. He doesn't think sometimes. He just goes after what he wants without a care for who he stomps on in the process. Plus, we weren't as close as before anymore. Ever since high school started, he'd been hanging out with some bad guy. I told him that Amy was a liar and that she would soon go off him. But he just shrugged and said, whatever. I know you're probably wondering why I stayed friends with Danny after what he did. I guess I'm too nice, but I just couldn't break our seven-year relationship over this. It was bad enough I'd lost the love of my life. I couldn't afford to lose my best friend too. Yes, I felt betrayed and angry, but Amy had made her choice, and it wasn't me. Then one night, I was on my way home on the metro. The only free seat was next to Amy, so I sat down next to her. At first, it was awkward, and neither of us spoke. Then I asked her, why did you cheat on me? She replied, well, Danny's the richest, most popular, and best-looking guy in school. I only used you to get closer to him. This was horrible to hear. I was so mad that I chose to stand for the rest of the journey back. The next day, I tried telling Danny what Amy had said. He told me I was just being jealous, shoved me, and yelled at me that I needed to stop being so bitter. We didn't talk for two weeks after that. I felt so lonely, but it turns out neither Danny nor Amy were the people I thought they were. Danny tried calling, but I ignored his calls. He also sent me some lame apology messages, but I didn't reply. Then one day, he showed up on my doorstep, gave me chocolate, and asked me to go for a walk in the woods with him. I took my GoPro with me. As I said before, I love nature. I always film the scenery on my walks. I asked him if he truly loved Amy, and to my surprise, he said that girls were like chewing gum. You had to chew till the end and then spit them out. He said he would use Amy one last time, then finish with her, then let his friends have her. Then he would move to another city and do it all over again. This was shocking to hear. I knew he could be reckless, but I didn't think the boy who saved my life when we were 10 was capable of being so cruel. I told him I never wanted to talk to him again, and I stormed off. My GoPro had been recording the whole time. So, it was about time I took revenge on my shattered heart, wasn't it? Thing is, as mean as Amy has been, I still care about her. I thought about it a lot, and eventually decided that she deserved to know the truth. So I sent her the recording. Even after seeing it, she made out I'd edited it to make Danny sound bad, as I was just jealous. I knew that her parents thought she was so sweet and innocent, so I told her that if she didn't split up with Danny, I'd send them the video clip. She tried to resist at first, but soon she gave up and begged me not to show it to them. I later found out that she'd continued to see Danny in secret for weeks after that. But eventually, she saw the dark side to him. 
She even came up to me at school and thanked me for trying to help her and apologized for hurting me. I didn't try to save her from Danny because I was feeling sympathetic toward her or anything like that. Instead, I believe that witnessing a crime is as bad as committing it. I guess that as mean as Amy had been to me, I didn't want to see her hurt. Especially not by that jerk. Actually, after that, she's even reached out to me once and asked me to be her boyfriend again. But of course, I wasn't a fool. A leopard can't change its spots. So I made it clear to her that my answer was and would always be no. And that we should just stay friends. While me and Danny, we aren't friends anymore. I have other friends, but it's hard. As a part of me does still miss him, but I don't like the person he's become. Thanks for listening to my story. I hope that you guys don't go through what I did. But if you do, I hope you find the strength to do the right thing, however hard this may be. I was standing outside of college chatting to my friends when suddenly a police car pulled up and from the car's window, a handsome police officer waved at me, then told me to hurry up. I excitedly waved back at him, said goodbye to my friends, and rushed to him in front of their admiring eyes. So I'm Daisy, and the handsome cop is Levi, my amazing, brave boyfriend. We first met at the library in town. I was there for my studies and he was looking for some crime books. We started dating, and now a year later, we're madly in love. There are so many things that I love about dating a cop, such as seeing him in his uniform. It never fails to make me beam with pride. And I'm not gonna lie, he has abs of steel due to all of his workouts. Swoon! Besides, he has the cutest quirky habits. Like, when we go to a restaurant or the theater, he always scans it first to check if it's safe. But as good as being with him is, there are a few bum points, such as his unpredictable work schedule. Day, night, weekends, you name it, he works it. Then when we finally managed to plan something, he sometimes got an emergency phone call and had to bail on me. This sucked, especially when it was my sister's wedding. But without a doubt, the most annoying thing of all is his popularity with other girls. They're like moths to a flame around him, especially this one colleague of his, Ellie. One time, Levi brought his colleague Brad over while I was there studying. I heard Brad remark, Levi, I never thought you'd end up with a bookworm. I thought you'd end up with Ellie. Everyone can see you two have a strong connection. Levi tried laughing it off and saying that it was nonsense but the jealousy rose up in me. By the time Brad left, I was really upset about it, so I packed up my books and went to leave. He stopped me and asked me what was wrong. Trying my best not to cry, I blurted out, Why aren't you with Ellie? You spend all your time with her. He shook his head, smirked, then said, Ignore Brad. He's a joker. And yeah, I spend time with Ellie. I work with her. But it's you I love, and everyone knows it. In fact, why don't you move in? Then we can spend more time together. My sadness was soon overlapped by happiness, and I jumped into his arms and squealed out, really? Yes, for sure! This was so exciting. I moved in a few weeks later, and at first, living with Levi was the best thing ever. But over time, there were little niggling things that started to play on my mind. For example, one day, I was chatting to the new neighbor when Levi arrived home and in a stone-cold voice demanded I go inside. Then he sternly told me never to talk to strangers. But come on, I'm a naturally chatty, friendly girl who loves talking to people and making new friends. I don't know, I guess it was me overreacting? I mean, he was just looking out for me, right? But then, his need for control worsened when once... I arranged to meet my friends in town. Levi was going to come too, but then he had a last-minute work call and couldn't. When I said I'd just get a taxi, he freaked out and told me I couldn't go. After I got upset about it, he reluctantly agreed to let me go. He called a reputable taxi firm to pick me up. 
then told me I had to be back by 10 p.m. But after a few drinks, I lost all sense of time. I was just having too much fun. I was dancing with my friend when Levi stormed in, grabbed my arm, and pulled me out of there. Everyone was staring at us, not helped because he was in his cop uniform. I even heard one man tut out, It's always the innocent looking ones, isn't it? It was so embarrassing. At home, I sat there brooding while he got me a glass of water. When he tried passing it to me, I jumped up to my feet and screamed at him. You're being ridiculous! And thanks to you, everyone in the bar thinks I'm some sort of criminal! I don't need a curfew! It's not like that, he sighed. But I was so upset, I brushed past him and slammed the bedroom door behind me. I cried myself to sleep. I hated arguing with him. I gave him silent treatment throughout the next day. But then in the evening, he arrived home with a gift box and apologized for making me sad. That was so sweet. I gave him a hug and said, I'm sorry too. Then I opened the box. It was a really lovely watch. I noticed that it had an extra button on it, but I didn't think much of it. I stared down at it admirably as he fixed it on my wrist. That's how caring my boyfriend was. So I decided to buy him something too. The next day after college, I went to the mall. Suddenly, Levi called me and asked me where I was. I wanted the gift to be a surprise, so I told him I was at home. Crossly, he said, Daisy, don't lie to me. I know you're at High Hill Shopping Mall. Come home at once. Huh? How did he know that? I gave up on finding a gift and went home. When he got back, I asked him how he knew where I was, and I saw him briefly glance at my watch. Then, he admitted that he had GPS fitted to it, but it was only so he could keep me safe. What? I wasn't a kid anymore. How could he use it to follow me? We had a huge fight, and I told him he was controlling and crazy, and he needed to stop treating me like a little kid. Then I shut myself away in the bedroom. The next day, when I woke up, Levi had already left for work. I was so wound up, so I decided to go for a jog to clear my head. Obviously, I left the watch at home, and also my phone. When I got back, I was about to head for the shower when I heard my phone ringing. It was Levi. Then I noticed that I had 50 missed calls and a ton of messages from him. What? This wasn't normal. I'd only been gone for an hour at the most. Anyways, I put the watch back on, then suddenly the door banged open and Levi stormed in, and he yelled at me, Are you okay? Where did you go? Why didn't you answer my calls? This sucked, as I love him, but I knew I couldn't live like this anymore. So I told him I needed my freedom, then headed for the door. He looked so mad as he grabbed my hand, pulled me into the upstairs room, then locked me inside. I banged on the door and pleaded with him to let me out. Daisy, trust me. This is for your own good. You're not safe out there. Then I heard his footsteps trail off and knew he'd left. I curled up into a ball and cried myself to sleep. When I woke up, it was getting pretty dark out there. I searched the room for something to help me and found a rope ladder. The perks of living with a prepared cop. I used it to climb out of the window. But as soon as I reached the ground, two men appeared. Then suddenly, the world turned black. When I opened my eyes, I realized that I was in a dark, damp room, and I was tied up. The two men were sitting by the door and talking to each other. I began to panic. I'd seen enough movies to know that this was bad. One of the men looked over at me, and I quickly closed my eyes. But it was too late. He'd seen I was awake. So he walked over and said, Ah, welcome back, sweetheart. Panicked, I asked, Who are you? Why me? He sniggered out, Ah, oh, yes. If only that boyfriend of yours was here. Then we could ask him. Then he picked up his phone, and seconds later, I heard Levi's voice in the other line. Hello? Remember me? We seem to have something of yours. I heard the fear in Levi's voice. Let her go! Your wife's death wasn't her fault! It's your fault she's dead. 
Now it's your turn to lose the woman you love. Come here alone, if you want to see her face again. And don't even think about calling for backup. He hung up the phone, then peered down at me, before he kicked the empty barrel next to me. I jolted back, and he laughed. It was terrifying. Not long after that, they dragged a beaten-up man into the room. Levi! Oh no! Levi managed to look at me, forced a smile, and slurred out, My flower girl, don't worry, I'm here now. The gang laughed at this. Then he stopped in front of Levi and said, I think you and me need a little chat. Let's call it man business. I knew I needed to find a way to help him. But what? That's when I looked down at my watch. It already had GPS, so perhaps the extra button did something. I struggled to press it, which wasn't easy with roped hands, trust me. But eventually, I managed to. By this point, Levi was unconscious, and I started sobbing. I didn't want to lose him. Not like this. The one man set something up next to him. Oh no, it was a bomb! He sneered out. You have 30 minutes left to say goodbye to your lover, boy. Then the man left. I called Levi's name and sobbed out how I loved him. I honestly thought we were both going to die there. And watching the timer count down to our doom was the worst feeling ever. Suddenly, the door burst open. At first, I thought it was those men back again. But instead, Brad and his team rushed over, saw the bomb, then quickly got both me and Levi out of there. I was pushed to the ground just before there was a big bang, and the house exploded. On the way to the hospital, Ellie explained everything to me. So, turns out, this involved a difficult criminal case that happened last year. Levi had been investigating a group of drug dealers, but an incident happened, and the gang's leader's wife accidentally fell from the building and died. They arrested most of the dealers, but some got away, including the gang leader. Then recently, Levi had received images of me outside college and our house from them, and took this as a threat to my safety. Well, that explained all of Levi's controlling and weird behavior. I felt so bad for misjudging Levi. He was the sweetest, bravest man, and I loved him so much. I stayed by his side as he recovered in hospital. Then one day, he finally opened his eyes, looked at me, and muttered out, There's my flower girl. I hugged him. Gently, of course. It was such a relief to know he was going to be okay. The gang is still out there somewhere, but hopefully they'll catch them soon. I do worry about it, but it's okay, as I know I have Levi to protect me. After all, he's my real-life action hero, and I know that with him by my side, we'll get through anything. Not to brag, but these are really tasty. I bet even Grace, my picky sister, would finish this whole thing in one sitting. My cooking abilities were definitely up there with Michelin star chefs. I took another bite out of a fajita when I heard noises coming from the living room. Ah, Grace must be back. There she was, sprawled out on the couch, surrounded by her handbag, heels, jacket, and other stuff. Grace, we've talked about this. I can't keep on tidying up after you. I have studying to do, I said as I picked up her things. Suddenly, Grace sat up, rested her head in her hands, then looked at me with sad eyes. An uneasy feeling welled up in my heart. Oh no, what was wrong? She sighed and as she glumly stared at the floor, she said, Easton, pack your things. We're moving out tomorrow. What? Again? I couldn't contain my shock. Why, Grace? Do you owe someone money again? Grace didn't answer, so I worriedly asked, How much do you owe this time? Seven thousand dollars, she mumbled. What? Seven thousand dollars? That's crazy. What did you borrow so much money for? I plopped down on the sofa in disbelief. I sat there, frantically wondering how to deal with Grace's enormous debt. 
Her extravagant spending habits had started after our parents passed away. I guess she was trying to numb out her grief with the latest must-have outfit. Then suddenly, she burst out laughing. <laughs> Come on, bro, I'm just kidding. Huh? I gaped at her. Grace, it's not funny. For an instance there, I actually thought we'd have to elope or something. She grinned at me. Um, if there's no debt, then why are we moving again? I followed her as she walked out of the room, took a piece of fajita, and popped it in her mouth. Then she began to tell me everything. Turns out she'd found herself a sugar daddy fiancé, and we were moving in with him. I frowned at her. So what, now you're marrying some granddad? Why do you... Without letting me finish my sentence, Grace tapped my head with her knuckle. Do you seriously think a beautiful and famous model like me would marry some old man? Yet, even as a famous model, you still can't afford all of your branded goods. Then you have to keep on moving house all the time to avoid the debt collectors. I winked at Grace. She was about to hit me on the head again, but I dodged it. Ha! The next morning, there was a knock at the door. So I opened it to find a good-looking man in his mid-40s standing there. Ah, turns out he's Owen, my future brother-in-law. Before I had a chance to say anything, Grace tottered over in her heels and wrapped her arms around his neck. Honey, why are you so late? I'm so nervous. Smiling, Owen said, Darling, there's nothing to worry about. Everything's ready to welcome you and Easton. They continued coddling each other, so I quickly walked away. Seeing them like that gave me goosebumps. Ugh, cheesy. Owen drove us to his house. Well, I say house, but it was more like a royal palace. Inside there was a classic design to the place with a luxurious style. I spotted a girl about my age sitting on the couch. Her arms were folded and she had a disgruntled look on her face. Owen looked at her and said, Vivian, why are you still sitting there? Come and welcome your stepmom and uncle. Vivian smirked and coldly replied, No thanks. I'm not in the market for a new stepmom, especially one who's barely out of high school. Then she stormed off, slamming the door behind her. Oh no, she hates me! Does she? Seeing Grace look worried, Owen, though obviously a little angry, still tried to reassure her. It's okay, she's just being a typical teenager. Give her a few days and I'm sure she'll be fine. As for me, I was a little... No, I had to admit that I was very nervous. Vivian's sharp-eyed look had made me feel uncomfortable. I mean, I think a tank full of sharks would have been more welcoming than her. Looks like my new home life wouldn't be easy. The next morning, while I was helping Grace take some pictures of her posing in the living room, you know, for the gram, she suddenly yelled so loud that I had almost dropped the phone. Hey, hey, take that dog out right now! Hurry up! I turned around and saw Vivian walking what looked like a white cloud across the room. Seeing that, I ran toward her and said, Vivian, please take it outside, as Grace is allergic to dog fur. Vivian rolled her eyes and replied, This is my home, and this is my dog. Then she sparked as she let go of the dog lead. Oops! Her fluffy cloud dog immediately ran over to Grace and started barking at her. Grace yelped out, grabbed the pillow, then tried using it as a shield as she continued to scream at the dog to go away. At that moment, Owen appeared from upstairs, and with an angry look on his face, he snapped at her. Vivian, get Teddy out of here right now. No, it's them who should leave, she argued, while her dog barked so hard that Grace huddled up tighter in the corner of the couch and cried nonstop. Vivian, you've been warned. If you do it again, then I'll have no choice but to find Teddy a new home. Owen shouted loudly. Vivian huffed out, then gave Grace a fierce look as she picked up the dog and walked off. Man, it was true that life here wasn't easy at all, and it was about to get a lot harder. The next day, I was rearranging my new room when I heard a loud noise coming from downstairs. I went to check it out and found Grace instructing two maids on where to hang a giant print from one of her modeling photo shoots, and laying on the ground was the picture of Vivian with Owen and her mom. Move a little right? No, a little left. Okay, Grace ordered them. I hurried over to her and asked, Um, what are you doing? She smiled. I'm just making a few decor adjustments. It looks far more luxurious now, don't you think? Then she picked a gray vase off the table and threw it into the trash can. 
then placed a double swan figurine in its place. Now that's much better, she rubbed her hands together. God, I know Grace was just trying to claim her position as host, but even so, she shouldn't have taken down the picture of Vivian's mom, if she knew. At that moment, a scream interrupted my train of thought. Vivian's. Sigh. I knew it. Grace, how dare you? Vivian blushed with anger. Then Grace interrupted her. This is my house too, and I have the right to put my mark on it. It makes the room look far more modern. No, you have no right. Take down that disgusting picture and put the old one back. This is my house and your father will soon be my husband. So I can do what I please. So stop your childish strops and just accept it. Vivian resentfully picked up the family picture, then quietly took it up to her room. As a witness to it all, I have to be honest, I thought Grace was being outrageous. After all, Vivian's mother passed away not too long ago, so it was only natural to not accept the stepmother, right? But now Grace was messing things up and seemed to want to delete all of the images of Vivian's mother in this house. That wasn't cool. That evening, I was reading The Theory of Everything in the garden when I felt a pat on my shoulder. I looked up to see Owen. Easton, I'm just letting you know that schools are all set up for you. You start next week. Then he added, Ah, you don't have a car yet, do you? I shall ask Vivian to give you a lift. You're in the same class anyway. Wait, what? I was actually going to the most prestigious and expensive school in the area? That's a dream come true, but... I heard that all the other kids that went there were rich and influential. Could a poor guy like me adapt to the luxurious environment there? A feeling of uneasiness suddenly welled up in my heart. But then I told myself that everything would be fine. Monday morning arrived and I made sure I was ready early. I lingered around in the kitchen waiting for Vivian, but 30 minutes later and she still hadn't appeared. I started to panic as I didn't want to be late on my first day. That was the type of bad first impression that would stick. I was about to walk to the bus stop when I saw Vivian slowly coming down the stairs. She winced at me and said, Oh, you're still here. I suppose you want to come with me then? I didn't answer and just followed her to the car. As soon as I sat down, she sped away. I hadn't even fastened my seatbelt yet, which I then tried to do in a fumbled panic. Every time she pressed down on the accelerator, my heart skipped a beat. Then, after some hellish ten minutes, she stopped the car. Whew! I was still alive. But hang on. This wasn't school. I turned to Vivian and stammered to ask her, but she cut me off. Get out of my car, and if you dare tell anyone how you know me, you will pay! Then she raised her fist to my face. Wow, she didn't have to be that aggressive. But fine, anyway. I didn't want to have anything to do with her either. As I briskly walked to school, I found myself worrying that this would be like it was in the movies, and I'd be teased for being the newbie. The school came into view, and damn, it was even more spectacular in real life. I took a deep breath to muster up the courage to enter the school. The grandeur and beauty of the place was so overwhelming. I was used to graffiti-covered desk and a jam locker door. Not here. Even the restroom door signs were expensive-looking. I was wandering aimlessly trying to find my classroom when suddenly I saw this girl walk ahead and drop something. I picked it up and called after her. Sorry, is this yours? The girl turned around then squeaked out. Oh my God, thank you. You're my knight in shining armor. I can't live without my glossy lipstick. Then she started doing this odd pose. Then she pouted and flicked out her hair. Was this a rich girl thing? It was very confusing, but hey, I guess she seemed nice. I smiled at her, then turned to walk away. That's when I noticed the groups of girls in the corridor. They were all staring at me, and one of them even winked. Then I overheard some of them talking about me. One of them said, Ooh, he's cute. And another said, It's about time we had a new hot boy in this school. Well, girls from rich schools were weird. I know I'm quite a good-looking guy, but I'd never had girls act like this toward me before. I chuckled inwardly and went to find my class. It seemed inevitable that my school life was destined to be rather, um, interesting. Hi everyone. Have you ever had someone get revenge on you? It's not fun, right? Well, this is my story about revenge, but with a twist. 
You won't believe who my prankster turned out to be. Oh, let me introduce myself. I'm Audrey, and I'm 24. To say I've had an unhappy life would be an understatement. Firstly, my dad ditched my mom for another woman. And not long after that, my mom passed away from a serious illness. Basically, my entire life fell apart in a matter of months, and I was still too young at that time. It was tough growing up, and I always think that my life could never turn the page again. But on one fine day, someone popped into my life and changed everything. His name was Jim, and he was seven years older than me, and he seriously turned my life around. He lived in another city, but he often came to my city on business trips. We fell for each other quickly. That happiness didn't last long, though. One day I was working in the clothes store when a girl around the same age as me came in. She wanted my help to choose some dress, but she was pretty rude to me and I kept catching her staring at me with evil eyes. Who was she? And why was she treating me like that? Finally, after about two hours, she made up her mind and picked up only a tie that she wanted to buy for her husband instead. I was relieved to get rid of her, but shocked when I saw the name on her credit card. Jim Stewart. Her husband had the exact same name as my boyfriend. What a coincidence. She must have caught me staring at the card because she suddenly said, Yes, Jim is my husband. Now stay away from him. What? Her husband? My Jim. Before I even had a chance to react, she turned to everyone in the store and said, This girl is a gold digger, and she's trying to break up my marriage. I was shocked. I tried to explain that it wasn't true, but she wouldn't listen to me. She just stormed out, and I was left standing there hearing people whispering about me. It was the most humiliating moment of my life. I immediately ran to the staff room and called Jim. I was really hoping it had all been a big misunderstanding, but I could tell from Jim's tone that it was the truth. He told me he'd lied to me, and that he actually lived in the same city. He just made up the business trip stuff so he wouldn't have to see me often. Then he said, Audrey, I honestly love you. I'm serious about us. Hang on, was he for real? It was ridiculous. I was disgusted by him. How could he treat me like that? I hung up and felt horrified. It brought back horrible memories of the woman who stole my dad away from my mom. I didn't want to be that woman. The next day, I moved out of the house Jim had rented for me. I didn't want to be associated with that loser anymore. But life works in mysterious ways. The day I moved into my new house, I saw Jim's wife. And you won't believe it. It seemed that she just moved in next door too. Was this some kind of joke? As soon as she saw me, she smirked and said, Wow, what a coincidence. Hello, neighbor. I'm Linda. Seeing her unpacking her stuff all by herself, I couldn't help but wonder where Jim was. But then I thought maybe Linda had ended things with him and had moved here alone. I hope so anyways. I'd hate to have Jim as a neighbor. So that's when my new life began. And it has been crazy ever since. From that first week of living there, Linda started pranking me. It all began with her throwing trash into my yard. I even caught her doing it, and she just grinned and said, Oops, my hand slipped. Then she walked away laughing. It made me furious. And that was just the beginning. One weekend, a delivery guy rocked up on my porch with ten extra large pizzas. I tried to explain I hadn't ordered them, and that's when Linda appeared at my door and said, Oh, thanks for ordering me dinner, Audrey. I'm starving. Then she grabbed five of the pizzas and ran to her house, leaving me there with a bill of $100. Jeez, it was so annoying. And I had no option but to pay. Linda was too much. Seriously. As much as her pranks drove me up the wall, I also felt sorry for her. I knew what it was like to have someone you love stolen away from you. She must have hated me so much for ruining her marriage even though it hadn't been my fault. I decided to just put up with her pranks. She'd get over it eventually, and it's not like they were harming me, right? Well, one night I heard the doorbell. I wasn't expecting anyone and was surprised to see a young guy standing there with a poster that said, I agree to be your boyfriend. Come out with me. I was totally puzzled and told him he had the wrong house, but then he showed me the address on the other side. It was my address. What on earth? I told him I wasn't interested, but he tried to grab my hand and said, Come on, girl, don't be shy. I told him if he didn't leave me alone, I'd call the police. So luckily, he ran away. Needless to ask, I knew for sure that was Linda's joke. But this time, she had taken it too far. I decided to go over and have a word with her once and for all. As I was walking to her house, I saw someone familiar on the other side of the road. I couldn't believe it. It was my dad? So many years had passed. 
and he'd completely changed, but there was no doubt it was him. I suddenly blurted out, Dad? But I didn't know what to do next. I was just thinking about my next move when I felt someone behind me. I turned around and saw Linda. She just smirked at me and walked away. What was her problem? Did she hear what I just said? I was so shocked at seeing my dad, I ran back into my house. I hated him for what he'd done to my mom. But he was still my dad, and I wanted to know if he was okay and what he was doing here. I barely slept that night as I couldn't stop thinking about my dad. The next morning, I was sitting by the window when he appeared again. This time, he was with Linda, and she was holding his arm. What was she doing with my dad? Why were they so close? Later that day, I saw him again, and this time, he and Linda were hugging. OMG, were they dating? Maybe Linda had heard me call him dad, and now she was flirting with him to truly get revenge on me. This was too much. The thought of Linda as a stepmom made me want to puke. I waited and waited, but he was inside her house and there was no sign of him leaving. Eventually he left, and as soon as he was in his car, I ran over to her house. I was shaking as I knocked on the door, and as Linda opened it, I said, You are way too much. Can you just stop with the revenge already? Linda looked confused and said, What the heck are you talking about? Linda still didn't seem to get it. And I was about to explain when I heard footsteps. I turned around and my dad was right there. He said, What's the matter, Linda? Why are you fighting with this stranger? Huh? Stranger? Didn't he recognize me? Then Linda butted in and said, It's okay, Dad. We're just having a misunderstanding here. What? Dad? Is he your dad? Really? I stammered. Yeah, why? What's the matter? He said, Linda, you don't need to lie to me. I know you're dating my dad to get revenge on me. I continued. Whoa, hold on. What do you mean your dad? Linda gasped. At that, my dad looked confused too and walked to me and asked if he could look at my hand. After seeing my birthmark, he started crying and hugging me. Audrey, it's you. It's really you. I didn't know how to react, so I just let him hug me. It had been so long since anyone had held me like this. Ever since my mom had died, I'd tried to be strong and keep it together, but suddenly I couldn't hold back anymore. I burst into tears in his arms. We stood like that for a long time, and eventually he took me into Linda's house and told me the story. It turned out, after he left me and my mom, he got tricked by that woman, and he was so ashamed, he decided to move to another city and start over. He was working hard on a construction site one day when he got injured, so he ended up in hospital. And that's when he met Linda. She'd been in a car accident and needed a blood transfusion urgently. She has a pretty rare blood type, but luckily my dad had the same type and he volunteered to give her a transfusion. After that, they became quite close, and seeing as Linda had lost both her parents in the car accident, my dad eventually adopted her. I couldn't believe it. My dad had been through so much, and this whole time, I thought he was off living his life with a rich woman. I felt so bad for him and decided to leave the past behind and forgive him. As for Linda, she was also left confused by this coincidence, so she left the room to process everything, while I and Dad took time to catch up on our lives. Later, Linda prepared dinner for us three, and before we digged in, she shyly grabbed my hand and said, Audrey, I've been so awful to you. I'm sorry. I know you aren't the one responsible for my divorce, but I still felt upset, and that's why I played all those pranks. That was so childish, right? Please forgive me. Sister, we laughed it off, then hugged each other to make peace. I couldn't believe it. After all these years of being lonely, suddenly I had a sister, and my dad was back. My life had finally turned a corner, and I almost laughed at the thought that it was all because of meeting Jim. At least one good thing had come out of that disastrous relationship. Hi, my name's Baron, and I'm 17. I guess that every student has at least one teacher that they hate, right? In my case, it's my PE teacher, Mr. Green. You're probably wondering why, so here we go. I'm an academic kid, and the sporty way of life just isn't for me. I actually enjoy studying, especially anything math and science related. I just don't understand why the school forces me to do PE. Spending hours jumping about in a sweaty mess just seems pointless to me. I could be using this time to read a coding book or something. I wasn't built for sports. I was the skinny kid who turned bright red just thinking about running. Then, during one torturous PE lesson, I couldn't jump over the horizontal bar at the boy's height. 
so the teacher lowered it to the girl's height for me, and worse still, I still couldn't jump over it. Humiliating. And after that, some small-brained boys nicknamed me Miss High Jump. Ugh, how annoying. Just when I thought it couldn't get any worse, in steps a new P.E. teacher, Mr. Green. Honestly, he was quite popular at school, as he was good-looking, muscular, and was a national medalist in the pole jump. Whenever he appeared, girls' squeals would be heard across the hall, and boys kept following him to ask about his diet and workout plan to get six-pack abs. Meanwhile, I couldn't stand him a bit. What's so good about that Hulk guy? Once I even spotted him checking out his reflection in his stopwatch. Pathetic. Mr. Green made the P.E. class hell. He always made us do these stupid exercise routines. Then when I messed up, he corrected me in front of everyone. It was so humiliating. Then he said, Baron, I get that sport is your weakness, so let's practice more and then you'll get bigger. Firstly, I didn't want to bulk up. And secondly, his actions made me a complete joke to my classmates. Why was he so strict with me? Was it because I was the only one not staring at him with gooey eyes? Great, as if it wasn't bad enough being called Miss High Jump, now I had Mr. Green to deal with. So, game on. It's time I hit him where it hurts, his appearance. I snuck into my mom's room and took one of her red lipsticks. Then I smeared it on his red whistle. And as expected, after blowing it, his lips were fully covered with red lipstick. It was so funny. Not so much Mr. Green anymore, more like Mr. Red. <laughs> Everyone was laughing, but no one told him why. Seeing his confused face was so hilarious. But then he went to the bathroom and seconds later he shouted. I rushed to see his reaction and OMG, it was priceless. However, catching me grinning at the bathroom door, he seemed to know who's to blame. Oops. After that, he was stricter with me. He always made me lug the training equipment for the whole class. Yes, only me. So I decided to get my own back. I poked some small holes in one of the tennis balls, then filled it with black ink. As expected when he hit it, all the ink inside went on his face and clothes. Ha! <laughs> he looked like an octopus. Of course, he knew it was me, so I ended up with a week's detention, but it was so worth it. That's when Mr. Green got determined to make my life a misery. He forced me to run extra laps on the field and made me attempt hurdles that I was never going to clear. And then he just smirked at me and said something like, Well, young Baron, practice makes perfect. The feud between us was endless. However, I soon had something much more important to care about. There was a new girl in my class called Susie, and oh boy, was she pretty. It was love at first sight, but unfortunately, I wasn't alone in liking her. Whatever, the other boys might have the brawn, but I had the brains. So I spent hours thinking up ways to impress her and to make her mine. I don't have a lot of experience in this sort of thing, so I turned to romantic films for help. And I quickly learned that girls loved soppy gestures, so I put a love letter in her locker. I even sprayed some of my mom's perfume on it. Girls like fragrant things, right? But when she opened the locker door, dozens of letters like mine fell out. Another time, I brought her some cupcakes. I planned to get to class early and leave them on her desk. Only when I stepped in the classroom, her desk was already covered in cakes, chocolate, and drinks. It was like stepping into a candy store. I needed to change the plan. I'd have to think big if I was going to impress Susie. So one day, I asked some friends to go up to Susie and annoy her. And then when she freaked out, I would swoop in to protect her. You know, like a hero. Everything was going according to plan, and I was about to run over and save the day, but then Mr. Green suddenly appeared. He scolded them and even threatened to report them to the principal. They were scared to death and immediately ran away. Mission failed. I was about to leave when suddenly I saw Mr. Green grab Susie's arm and whispered something to her. Whoa, what a slime ball. Susie looked really annoyed, but he didn't give up. I was so mad I ran over there and yelled at him. Let her go, or else I'll report this to the principal. Then, to his surprise, I grabbed her hand and led her away. After a while, I turned to Susie and asked, Are you okay? She smiled and said, Yeah, thanks for helping me. Her bright smile drove me crazy. I stammered. You're welcome. Uh, if he pesters you again, just tell me. And could you believe it? After that day, Susie and I became closer. She even texted me whenever she had problems with math, physics, or other subjects. See? Brain always wins. Then the following week, during another torturous P.E. class, I noticed Mr. Green trying to hand Susie a bottle of water. She wouldn't take it from him, but he kept on trying to pass it to her. What a weirdo. Fueled by love, I ran over to them, grabbed the water bottle, then said, She doesn't want it, so leave her alone. I led her over to the fountain to calm down. Then seeing how sad she looked, I said, Don't worry, 
I won't let him harm you. She turned to me and replied, It's okay. I don't think he means anything by it. Maybe he just cares about me. I interrupted her. No, he isn't a good guy. He wants you. She laughed and said that I got it all wrong, but I still felt worried, so I said, Today after class, let me walk you home. At first she refused, but I was insistent, so in the end she agreed. After that, I walked her home every day after school, and guess what? It turns out we got on so well. Time zooms by when I'm with her. I guess I should be thanking Mr. Green. It's because of him Susie knows who I am. But nah, he's a jerk. How dare he bug Susie? He was way out of line. He needed to be stopped. So one day I went to the sports hall where Mr. Green was arranging equipment, approached him and said, I know you like Susie, but she doesn't like you, so please stop disturbing her. If I report this to the principal, you'll lose your job. He continued to sort out the equipment, then smirking, he replied, It's not any of your business. This made me so mad, so I yelled at him. It is my business, as I love Susie, and I'll protect her at all costs. He laughed. You're not in a position to talk to me about this. Come back when you're Susie's official boyfriend. What? How dare he say that? His words played on my mind. So that evening, I decided to go to Susie's house to confess my feelings towards her. However, as soon as I arrived, I saw Mr. Green standing in front of her house. He grabbed her hand and hugged her. How dare he? Anger took over me as I quickly ran over, pulled Susie away, and then to my surprise, I punched him in the face. I don't know who was more shocked, him or me. Ouch, my hand hurt. Before I could say anything, Susie shouted, Dad, are you okay? Dad, what was going on here? I froze and stared at them. Baron, what are you doing? You've got it all wrong, he's my dad. What? Mr. Green was Susie's dad? Well, she could have told me that earlier. We went inside and Susie got the first aid kit and patched up Mr. Green's nose and my hand. Then she told me the truth. Turns out her mom and Mr. Green used to date back in high school. But then her mom fell pregnant with Susie. He freaked out and refused to be part of their lives. So her mom moved away with her. But now they were back in town and Mr. Green was apologetic for how he behaved and wanted to be a father to her. But she was struggling to move on from the past and forgive him. Whoa. I couldn't believe I punched my crush's dad in the face. Talk about embarrassing. Although he looked more humiliated at the fact than me. A skinny boy with no athletic ability had actually made his nose bleed. That night I couldn't get a wink of sleep. Now Susie would never want to see me again and Mr. Green would hate me even more. Ugh, it was a huge mess. After that I tried to avoid Susie at school. As for Mr. Green, he stopped being so strict on me. Was he scared of Miss High Jump's punch now? Haha. <laughs> okay, I know, I shouldn't joke about this. But let me have a laugh. This man has just ruined his chance with the love of his life here. Then one day when I was tiredly walking back home, someone patted my shoulder. I turned back and saw Susie. To my surprise, she said, Hey, you promised to walk me home. Are you breaking your word or something? I stammered. I, I thought you hated me, so... She smiled and said that her dad didn't blame me either. In fact, thanks to my punch, they talked properly and now understood each other more. She leaned her head on my shoulder and said, Baron, thanks for always protecting me. Whoa, this day couldn't be better. The girl of my dreams didn't hate me, result. But I'm still scared to death of her dad. So basically, there are two missions that I need to complete. Firstly, I need to apologize to Mr. Green. And secondly, I need to improve my grade in PE class to impress him. The second mission sounds <laughs> near on impossible. So wish me luck, as I'm going to need it. Hey, I'm Vera, and I'm a college student. I live with my two friends, Ren and Dina. I've been friends with Ren since middle school and Dina since high school, so when we all talked about college, it just made sense to go to the same one and to rent a house together. One evening, I gave up on studying as my eyes had gone blurry, so I went downstairs where Ren and Dina were watching Love is Blind. I quickly squeezed myself in between them, but the problem was, we only had one small couch. And my butt's not the smallest. Dina whined that my arm was digging into her ribs, and Ren moaned that she was too squished up. Sick of their whining, I tried to move. Only, I couldn't. I was stuck. After a moment of silence, Dina started to laugh. Soon, we were all in fits of laughter. I guess it was pretty funny. The next day, Ren was on her laptop when she turned it to us and showed us a picture of a light gray armchair that was for sale at a nearby secondhand store. What do you think? She asked us. 
We all agreed that the armchair was a good idea. Out of all of us, Dina contributed the most money towards the armchair, as she had more savings than the rest of us did. One evening, we were sitting down eating popcorn and watching horror movies. I'm a natural-born fidgeter, and I'm also a wuss when it comes to scary films, so the others made me sit on the armchair. I curled up in the corner of the armchair and sneaked a peek behind my arm. Bad idea, as I managed to look during the scariest bit. I panicked and grabbed the arm of the chair's cushion surface so strongly that I almost burst it. I tried to push it back before the others noticed what I'd done. That's when I saw something stuck under it. I reached inside and pulled out so many envelopes. There was money in each of them, and lots of them were left down there. Um, guys? I showed Ren and Dina one of the open envelopes. They helped me flip the armchair and remove the rest of the envelopes. We discovered around about $200,000 hidden in it. We skipped class the next day and sat down and had a serious discussion about how to use the money. Ren and Dina were both demanding 60% of the money each. Ren said she deserved more as she'd found the armchair online, while Dina argued that she deserved more as she'd contributed the most towards it. But hello, I was the one who discovered the money. You don't deserve it. You just spend it all on those vile hair products you use. Newsflash, they make your hair look limp and stink. Dina shouted at me. Her words hurt, so I snapped back at her that she was a terrible flirt, and all the boys thought she was weird. Dina looked so mad that at one point, I actually thought she was going to lunge at me. Ren tried to calm us down, which only made Dina aim her anger at her. Quit being Little Miss Perfect all the time. No one buys your act. <gasps> Well, at least boys actually like me and don't think I have fat arms, she snarled back. This comment caused me to snort, which made Dina glare straight at me. It's better than having a fat butt. Our insulting match went on for a while, and it got personal. In the end, we were all emotionally drained and feeling pretty rubbish about ourselves. Their words hurt. They were meant to be my two best friends in the whole world. Crying, we apologized to each other and hugged it out. Our friendship was too important to let some mystery money get in the way, so we decided to return the money to where we bought it. We went back to the second-hand store and asked the woman where the armchair had come from, as we'd found something important in it. The rude woman refused to pass on any details to us. Wondering what to do next, I picked up an envelope and looked inside. That's when I noticed the address written on a small piece of paper in the envelope. We drove there, but on the way, Ren received a phone call. It was a woman called Clara who'd claimed to be the one who'd sold the armchair to the second-hand store. Apparently, the store woman had rung her up saying there was a problem with it and had passed on Ren's number, as it was on the store's buying records. We told Clara the address we were going to and said she could meet us there. When we arrived, another car pulled up behind us. It was Clara, who said she had no idea who lived at this house. We explained to her how we'd found something in the armchair, but we needed to talk to the person at this address about it too. We walked up to the door. A middle-aged woman opened the door for us, and she looked so shocked to see Clara. When I showed the woman the envelope and asked our questions, she burst into tears and told us everything. Turns out, the woman had an affair with Clara's father, and they even had a child together. For 20 years, he sent her money, but she always sent it back to him. It was only until a few months ago that the money stopped. Clara said that her father died a few months ago. He loved that armchair, so she'd sold it, as it was too painful for her to keep it. She had no idea about the money hidden in it, or about her secret half-brother. The lady begged Clara to forgive her, as she didn't mean to be the third person and wreck another family. Crying, Clara said she loved her father, and nothing could change that. They hugged each other, and suddenly, a guy around my age ran from the house in tears and also hugged them. Oh my god, we have never seen such a beautiful scene. I mean, we have never seen such a handsome guy. And just looking at my two friends, they didn't seem to be able to keep their cool anymore. They all agreed that the money would belong to the sun. Three of us got in the car and sat quietly for a pretty long time. I honestly don't know why I was silent. I was just seeing my two friends seem dumb and serious. Suddenly, Ren said, He's mine. And Dina replied, 
Sorry? Who is yours again? I drove back as Dina turned in the passenger seat so she could squabble it out with Ren, who was on the back seat. <sighs> the money can't break our friendship, but I'm really worried this handsome guy will do it. Oh, I've never been in a negotiation that lasted this long before. I've been here since three, and it's now eight. Worse still, I hadn't even mentioned the funding yet. I've tried, but it was Dane's fault. He kept on interrupting me and going off topic. As I looked at Dane, who was currently reenacting a soccer game with condiments, I wondered how on earth was he a part of the student council? He might have been a senior, but he was an average grade student who didn't seem to excel at anything. He also exaggerated everything and mainly just messed around. I should never have agreed with Dane to arrange the meeting here. Not only had I wasted five hours of my life, but it looked like the funding was a no deal. I couldn't take any more of this. Remind me never to listen to Dane ever again. I grabbed my bag and was about to stand up when Mr. Johnson turned to me. Ruth, I love your idea. Funding all of it would be a bit of a stretch, but I can go to 80%. And if it becomes a yearly thing, I'll be happy to continue sponsoring it. I stared at him open-mouthed. Did I hear him right? Mr. Johnson, the owner of the local music shop, was actually agreeing to provide a big chunk of the funding for our student talent show? By the way... I like this Dane guy. <laughs> Today's been fun. Dane wooed. Yes, it's a dealio. And enthusiastically shook Mr. Johnson's hand. Wait, I was supposed to be the one to close the deal. Never mind. We had the funding. This was amazing. We did it. Dane punched the air. Hey, um, how did you? He gave a Cheshire cat grin as he replied. Never expected that, did you? What do you think of me now, Ruth the new president? I shrugged and laughed. Hey, how about a celebratory hug, huh? He lunged at me with open arms. Well, why not? This deserved a celebration, after all. We were jumping up and down, and I don't know, maybe I was delirious from the stupidly long meeting or something. But the next thing I knew, we were kissing. OMG! We immediately pulled away from each other and awkwardly looked the other way. After that, he drove me home in silence. Oh no, what was I thinking? Why did I, or anyone breathing, do that? It was Dane. Dane! Can you believe it? Well, okay, I suppose it'd been a difficult couple of months for me. As soon as I became president of the student council, my boyfriend Walter didn't congratulate me. No. Instead, he broke up with me. We'd been together for two years, but recently he'd spoken about marriage and buying a house. Um, not yet. I want to focus on my career first. But I guess me applying to the student's council and being all busy bee with work frustrated him even more. Now, I tried to distract myself with studying and council work, but I felt like I was getting ever closer to the edge of a cliff. One with hungry sharks circling the bottom. Ugh. And then there were the rumors being spread around school about me. Ruth's just a freshman. She won't be able to hack the pressure. And Ruth's so serious and boring. So I started working harder and harder to prove myself. Hence the talent show project. Only, geez, I was so exhausted. Both mentally and physically. This funding news was fantastic. But what was going on with Dane? Maybe he has some kind of secret power of attraction or something. Anyway, after that incident, he flooded me with calls and messages, even though I was crazy busy. After the twelfth call in a row, I stopped writing my essay and answered with an annoyed, What? Hey there, how are you feeling about the weather today? My name is Ruth, not there, and I don't care about the weather, I'm busy. Busy enough to correct my words like that? I don't think so. Ugh, fine. I agreed to go out for a quick coffee with him just so he'd stop bugging me. I stirred my spoon around my coffee as I glared at him, 
and said, Will you stop calling me? I need to study. He stuffed the majority of his muffin into his mouth and took ages to chew it. Then he wiped his mouth onto the back of his arm and said, You do realize all the other council members call you Military Ruth, right? Try not to be so difficult and chillax once, will you? Wow, that sucked. I didn't expect to be liked by everyone, but I was working my butt off for the council so they could at least appreciate what I was doing for them. I cleared my throat. I don't care. Work is work. I didn't become the president to make friends. But I know you're not like that, Dane continued. You might be going through a tough time. Still, you're the most stunning person I've ever met. My face brightened up, even blushed. What did he just say? You're beautiful, strong, and independent. He reached out and took my hand, and I tried to ignore the fact it was sticky from his muffin. Ew. I must be the luckiest guy ever to date a girl like you, Ruth. Those other girls are just jealous of you. I mean, you have this hunk, and they don't. Hold up. He said what? Date? I gave him a disgusted, who do you think you are look. Reading my expression, his face dropped. Oh, I, um, thought there was something between us. I froze for a few seconds. Was I being too harsh? I mean, he was totally sweet saying those words earlier. Fine, listen carefully. I'll hang out with you. Not dating. But you have to promise, swear, that you'll never, ever tell anyone about it. I don't know. I mean, he was so immature and annoying, but I guess he was also kind of fun to be around. He made me laugh, and I liked that. All I did was work, work, work. And perhaps that was why Walter broke up with me, wasn't it? Maybe when I hang out with Dane, I should practice being less serious. One Sunday, when we were having brunch at a random cafe of his choice, I asked about his graduation coming up that summer and his plan. Honestly, I haven't thought any further than finishing my freshman year, he said between chewing on his sandwich. How about you? he asked. Well, I want to go to an Ivy League college for a master, of course, preferably Dartmouth, and study social science. Then I want to work for the government, but high up, you know, like a managing role, and really make an impact, you know? Dane shrugged after I finished. Yeah, nice plan. And kept digging in his food. I felt weird. Was I being unrealistic? Or was it just Dane's point of view? But to have a happy relationship, maybe it's best to compromise and accept the differences, right? I snapped myself back into the now. If this whole thing with Dane hadn't happened, I would still be in anguish and despair. It was strange, but I did feel better around him unlike with Walter, so I should respect his opinions. Gotta learn from my mistake, right? One day, I was at a council meeting planning a fundraiser for the remainder of the talent show money. I decided it was time people saw the real Dane, so I made him event organizer. But this didn't go down well. As in the other council members' eyes, Dane was a lazy, idiotic puppet. Give him a chance. He's the one who persuaded Mr. Johnson to fund the talent show. Please, we never know other people's limits and abilities. Then, this girl Catherine sarcastically said, Of course you'd know his ability since he's your boyfriend. You suck at leading. All you care about is your personal feelings. I know. I'll date you. Then I may actually get given a job I deserve. My tongue was tied. I couldn't find a word to defend myself. And at the same time, I was really, really mad at Dane. And worse still, he hadn't even bothered showing up for the meeting. Afterward, I went round to Dane's house and furiously banged on the door. Yelled at him the moment he opened it. How come people know that we've been hanging out? Dane silently scratched his head, eyes open wide, and stared awkwardly at some random spot. Answer me! I continued, but still, no reply. I pointed my finger at his face. I just went through a hurricane of rage in a meeting with the council to put you in charge of the fundraiser event. And you didn't even bother showing up. 
You better do an amazing job, else we'll both be dead. Then I stormed off. Over the next few days, the rumors continued to circulate about me. Clearly, Dane had been bragging to everyone that he'd managed to score himself a stiff girl like me. That I was no tigress, more like a lovely kitten. Now everyone was staring and laughing at me, and made meow sounds at me in the corridors. Someone even filled my seat in the council room with cat food. This was horrible to deal with, but instead of supporting me, Dane went rogue from school for a full week. He also didn't arrange the venue for the fundraiser, meaning we had to reschedule the event. I was left looking bad, so the teacher gave me a lecture on responsibility and strongly advised me to leave the student council. So that's what I did. Catherine's in charge now. After that, I couldn't face school. So I locked myself away in my room and cried as I thought back to all the things that had happened. First, Walter left me. Then everyone else on the council mocked me. Then I lost my position on the council I worked hard for because I put my trust in the wrong person. Ugh, Dane. (laughs) What he did hurt the most, as he was exactly what others described him as, childish and insensitive. I was torn between never wanting to see him again and also missing him like crazy. Now I had no one. I felt so alone. Ah, darn it. Loneliness sucked. So when he called me, I answered. He told me he was outside my house. I guess I should at least hear him out, right? Hey, beautiful, listen. He grabbed my hand and looked straight into my eyes. It doesn't matter, okay? The council, the president position, those people don't matter. The most important thing is you being happy, and I'm going to make you happy. I wanted so much to believe his words. So I let him take me out. We ended up in this noisy restaurant with singing waiting staff. He found it hilarious, but I felt so uncomfortable. Then on the way back, he dragged me into this arcade and left me so he could go on the zombie killing game. As I watched him spin around then shoot, I realized how different we were. I guess I was holding on to him because I'd lost everything else. Who was I anymore? I felt like a stranger to myself. This wasn't me, and Dane wasn't right for me. He rushed over to me and excitingly clung onto my arm. Ruth, come see my high score! I shook my head and quietly said, It's over. I pulled my arm free and walked off. After that, I kept to myself, and at school, avoided Dane and my former council members as much as possible. It did hurt when I saw the posters for the talent show around the school, but that wasn't my problem anymore. I did receive a message from Dane saying something about his graduation party, but I skipped it. The truth is, he's just not good for me. Life was a joke to him, and as a result of this, He left me feeling like I was a joke, too. I felt so lost. So I'm going to spend the summer with my grandparents out in the country, away from everyone and everything. I need time to heal, so when I come back, I'll be strong, confident, and independent girl I once was. As I really do miss that version of me. Each one of us needs to learn how to overcome things by ourselves, without relying on others. Especially when these others in question aren't any good for us.